Let's get peppy. This is Pep 115. I am Chaz the Chidolo from Planet America, and this is Bill Wyman. Hello, Hello. Bill. Hi, Chaz. How are you? Not too bad. Now, for those who do not recall Bill Wyman, even though he's been on this podcast many times, he might be new to the podcast. You might have read uh, Bill in such publications as the Sydney Morning Herald, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, New York Magazine, Columbia Journalism Review, The Washington Post, Rolling Stone. Or maybe you heard him on NPR if you are American and were behind the scenes in the NPR office <laughs> in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> or if you're interested in Sinead O'Connor, because apparently you, you were on... I know, Sinead it was very sad. She died the other day and oh, they had yeah. an obituary in NPR and they happened to use a piece of tape with me talking about her How from about that? many years ago. Yeah. It's very sad. It is. Uh, uh, for, for those who are new to the podcast, this is Planet Extra Podcast is what PEP stands for. And it's like the offshoot of Planet America, which is a show that is on ABC. You can see it at 8 o'clock on Friday nights on the news channel, or you can see our videos on YouTube or Facebook. Uh, actually, can you do me a favor and watch this one? Not the one I'm coming up on Friday, because I've spent the last day working on an economics package <laughs> and I want someone to watch it. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about the economic stuff on this podcast because number one, it's full of graphs. I really apologize to our graphics person. There are so many graphs, but, and so it wouldn't really work on a podcast. And also I don't like to overlap between the, the, the two. And meetings. economics is really fascinating. Well, I hopefully, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say really, but I would say hopefully it's interesting it at is. least, <laughs> at least my report. Uh, but bottom line is it's, is, the, the economy is doing all right. And and not just because of, and, and I, this is not a Joe Biden puff piece because right around the world, the economy is doing better than people might think. And in particular in the areas of inequality, like we spent the last, I don't know, 10 years talking about all the inequality over the last 30 years. Well, th those statistics, they take a while to come in. And if you look at the last 10 years, the inequality, the inequality, the, the, the income gap and the wealth gap between the rich and the poor is closing, is closing. around the world. I'm not saying we're there yet, <laughs> but I'm just saying that that for, that when people ten years ago in, ten years ago were saying, "What can we do to solve this?" It's kind of solving itself to a certain extent. Anyway, you can find out about that on Planet America. Yeah. Um, I want to thank everyone. Just be a housekeeping bill before we get into first topic. I want to thank everyone for their well wishing with us returning in the comments. There've been some really nice comments, and I don't. I don't reply to everyone, so I just want to just thank you verbally. Um, even the people, even the haters. Thank you, haters. <laughs> thank you to everyone. Thank yeah. you. Um, I do read all the comments on Facebook and YouTube. I'm like that. That's my problem, unfortunately. Um, but uh, if you have any questions for us, some people are saying, where do you go for questions? If you have any questions for us to answer, I'm not saying we will, but if you put them in the comments on either our YouTube video or our Facebook video or or tweet them to us, um, the uh, we will at least read them. Whether we answer them is another thing altogether. Um, try and try and comment on the most most recent video if you want me to see it, because if it's an old video, I might miss it. Anyway, enough of that. Uh, before we get into the main topics, let's just do an update on Ohio because we are recording just after the Ohio results have come out. That's exactly right. And yeah. there have just been um, news things posted about it. Yeah. Well, well, do, do you want to just give us a, a recap on what we're talking about? Absolutely. And yep. what it is yep. is that um, in the wake of the Dobbs decision, yep. we're seeing a lot of places um, trying to either um, abrogate abortion rights or increase them. Yep. One of the states where that was going to happen this year is Ohio. Yep. There's going to be a big thing on the ballot in November to legalize or, or – um, to loosen the strictures on abortion in, in Ohio. So the state legislature, which is dominated by Republicans, put another measure on the ballot that just was happened today that would basically um, increase the the um, the wins for a, um, a, a, um, an initiative like that from 50% to 60%, yeah. so to make it more difficult. And as the Times reported, all the polls were saying support was at 58 59%. <laughs> so it was a very, very clever thing. However, this thing was defeated resoundingly. Yeah, 57 43 were the last numbers I saw. That might have changed since then. Have you yeah. seen more updated numbers? No, than that's that? like something like yeah. I thought it, I, I'm a little confused with the 58 59, but right in that same yeah. thing, which really gives you a sense of what the support is at the time. And please remember, 
number that A, we're talking about an off-year election in the first place in November, and now we're talking about an off-off-off election to stick it in August. Let's remember that this is summer in America, so it's sort of the equivalent of January here to put something on the ballot's time when nobody's paying attention and people came out. Um, I think it's a huge indication. It's another one of those indications, just like the vote in Kansas um, and some of the other... um, um, votes that we've had that the Dobbs is still re- resonating in the body politic. And I have some more to say about it. I think we're going to talk about the election later. And so let's get into that a little we bit. Will. But um, it's a pretty significant win for um, pro abortion forces, I think. Yeah. I, I, I would say, I mean, as you say, I think mean, correctly, they clearly were trying to sneak this through during the holidays when people weren't paying attention. And the fact that they ended up, and I should, I mentioned in the last week's, in, in the last PEP, that they actually passed. Ohio actually passed a law in January this year outlawing August ballot questions for exactly this reason, <laughs> unless they're for, for, for financial emergencies. And they, they just ignored their own law to push this through because they were so desperate to try and uh, cut off at the pass the abortion, the abortion question because they knew they were going to lose it. Oh, exactly. There's yeah. a lot of this so, sort of nefarious things. So, and yeah. another indication that I think we're into a weird territory here, and I, and I could be wrong, but in America, you know, you have these presidential elections every four years. There's always been a democratic move to try to get all the state and local elections mm. in, in cohorts with the November one because then you have more people coming out and the more people vote traditionally have helped Democrats. Yeah, you, you're, you're hoping to get people who are interested in abortion to vote so then they'll also vote for Democrats, essentially. Right, but yes. uh, but just in the sense of the quadrennial presidential elections mm-hmm. where you have the highest turnout, yes. okay? Yes. And then you have the off-year, mid-year elections, mm-hmm. right? But then a lot of states and cities put their the municipal and state elections on kind of odd years. Mm. And so there's always this kind of um, all across the country. And it's a free country in every state and and uh, city can do whatever it wants, of course. So here's one of the most important factoids from that thing yeah. is that in the 2022 primary elections, okay, where you had the governor, the Senate, and the House seats up, Okay, you had 1.66 million ballots counted. Okay, okay. Yep. for this off, off, off election on a technical point, you had 2.8 million votes cost. Wow, so you had 50% higher people voting than even in the interim state elections, which again is an indication that people are really fueled up about this issue. I think um, that's yeah. very powerful evidence. Yeah. Yeah. So, and remind me later on when we talk about the election yes. issues. Okay, yeah, that. that's very powerful. By the way, if you're wondering as I was, how anyone could justify trying to push this amendment through to increase the margins up to 60% in such a dubious fashion. Clearly, try, like, because while, yeah, obviously everyone knows it's about abortion, the numbers in the end show it's about abortion because 57 to 43 is basically the abortion numbers at the moment in Ohio. Yeah. So if people used it as a proxy for abortion, for abortion vote anyway. It's like they're having two abortion votes. <laughs> but, uh, um, but leaving that aside, these people have to make some kind of argument, like ostensible argument that's not about abortion for why they're trying to push this through. And the arguments they've made are just laughable. Like the, I've seen one argument where they're essentially suggesting that it's to, it's to, dis, to stop out-of-towners coming in and trying to influence Ohio <laughs> policy by hijacking these ballot questions. You go, oh, I see. The way you're protecting... Ohio voters from out of towners is by depriving them of the ability to get anything done. <laughs> like you're removing any power that they might have. Because of course the out of towners can only buy ads. They can't make you vote for them. That's still up to the Ohio voters that to is decide. Such a good point. <laughs> and, they, and this person say, no, no, we'll protect you from these out of towners by taking the taking your voting power away from you from diluting that voting power so then they won't come in well what a great yeah, argument that yeah, is yeah. and then the the other one which i thought was quite funny was frank larose who's the guy behind all this he's uh, the secretary of state who's running for senate um this is a quote from him imagine if the u.s constitution changed every year what instability would that create well that's what it ri- that's what's at risk mm-hmm. if we don't pass issue one as in, if, if, if there's a 50% margin instead of a 60% margin, they'll just change the constitution every year, he says. Yeah. Well, there's only one problem with that. They didn't invent these constitutional changes this year. They've been around for over 100 years. So why don't we look at what's actually happened? And what's actually happened is there have been 77 changes proposed over the last 100 and whatever years, and 19 of them got up. 
So it's not exactly every single year that they're changing the constitution. So these are some pretty lame arguments, but obviously they weren't convincing to anyone because, as I said, the margin is basically the polling on abortion in Ohio at the moment. Yeah. So anyway. And this has been a tradition in a lot of those states, and basically they get away with it because of apathy, mm-hmm. lack of information, and stuff like this. And obviously this has caught on. Mm-hmm. In the future, it'll be interesting when someone goes back and studies and finds out how information had been disseminated, what got people going, because obviously the media is the traditional daily newspapers aren't the same. Yeah. You still have a lot of right-wing radio in Ohio, which you assume would be pushing the other way. Yeah. But obviously this, um, this constituency was in live and it'll be really interesting to see why and how. It will. Before we move off, I just should just say, I should mention that they also have ballot initiatives in Ohio, which can be confusing because they've got these constitutional changes and ballot initiatives. A ballot initiative is like a law, essentially, passed by the people. They still have ballot initiatives. Even if this had passed, they would have the ballot initiatives with a 50% margin, mm-hmm. but then the state legislature could overrule, could overrule them. them yeah. There's <laughs> they, all sorts of skeevy uh, things yeah, like it, that. It's, a, yeah. it's about them retaining power. Anyway. Let's move on, shall we? And I will mention the Ohio thing when we get to the election section, and you can make whatever point you want to make about that. Okay. But first, let's talk about the indictment, because me and Dave talked about that at length for, well, for 50 minutes. That was the length in the last podcast. I know you got a lot to say, so I'm going to let you start and just say whatever you... I don't know what you're <laughs> going to say. Anything I want. Just no. say anything about the ident- indictment at well, all, and then I'll make a few very technical legal points. Yeah, and I'd like to hear what your your, your interests are. And then mm. just when I talk to people in mm. Australia, it's just interesting. Sometimes they ask these questions and there are elements of confusion. And even in the normal media in America, there's a lot of things that are elided mm. in, in, in so much um, of the reporting. Mm. So many reporters just think, oh, everyone knows that. Or it'll seem biased if we keep repeating this. Or it'll seem like it'll, it'll get the right wing upset. And I really deplore it, and I think it's bad on a journalistic level, and I think it's bad just in terms of um, buying into this idea that the mainstream media is biased against the Republicans or biased against the rights, which simply isn't true, I don't think. And in fact, what they do is they bend over so far that they they present a distorted view often and stuff like that. So I actually had just a little list of things that when you hear about America over the next year or year and a half, and I wrote a column in the Sydney Morning Herald about this the other day, which is probably going to be the most insane 16 months in American history. I mean, leaving aside the Civil War, 9-11, things not, like not that. 1968 was pretty wild, I think. Yeah, but I think <laughs> just the insanity that's yeah. going to happen, I yeah. just think is so unprecedented. Mm-hmm. And um, and the stakes, of course, are on are not on 1968 level mm-hmm. scary, but mm-hmm. but 1865 level scary. <laughs> yeah, or yes. 1860 level scary, yeah, okay? Yeah. So... Um, So just a few things to remember in that, and I I know it's very similar here, but there's a thing called a grand jury. And so what happens, you have this prosecutor and they go to independent citizens and they go, look, here's these laws, here's all this evidence, we're going to show you all these people, and you tell me if they broke the law. And if you do, we're going to prosecute the people. Yeah. Okay? So now there's a line in American, um, uh, when people talk about the legal profession, they say, oh, any good DA can get a grand jury to to indict a hand sandwich. Okay? It's just a typical thing. It's like, yeah, that's definitely definitely true mm-hmm. but we're operating on a very high level stakes here mm-hmm. okay so steak now steak sandwich hmm? a steak yeah, sandwich, steak sandwich. <laughs> yes. actually it's a mcdonald's hamburger with uh, <laughs> diet cokes and uh is what they've indicted mm-hmm. but you you have obviously you have a grand jury in the city of new york mm-hmm. and um and you've got one and you've got two grand juries one in southern district of florida one in this, i guess in washington dc yeah. and we got others coming and people should just remember that it isn't just a prosecutor saying, oh, we're going to get these guys. They actually have to go through a thing. And it's such a high-profile case, the um, impetus would be that it would have to be twice as strong as it normally would. Mm. So the idea of what Trump and all these people say is, oh, it's a rogue, blah, blah, blah. It's it's actually precisely the opposite, mm. that that you'd have to he'd have to go far, 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 far over breaking the law before they even get the attention, and then even farther than that to go through all the motions and all the um, michigas that's going to rain down on everyone involved mm. when this happens. Okay, that's number one. Um, we should also remember that he's innocent until proven guilty. Yeah. People don't actually say that a lot. Yeah. Um, there's a really famous, do you remember Doonesbury cartoon? Do you know what yes. Doonesbury is? Yeah. Um, there's a famous one back in the Nixon thing where Mark, uh, whatever his name is, he was a college radio DJ. <laughs> and there's a famous Doonesbury book and it's called Guilty, Guilty, Guilty <laughs> about Richard Nixon. <laughs> yes. And it always reminds me about that. And that's what we're all thinking, of course. Mm. And as the joke goes, I mentioned this on the podcast before, all the, the late night comics were saying this. It's, it's really great that the Justice Department is finally getting around to prosecuting Donald Trump for doing all the things that we watched him do in public <laughs> and that we knew were illegal at the time, yeah. okay? Um, that said, he is innocent until proven guilty. 
Um, another thing to remember that we, we hear this talk about the administration, the Republicans and Trump's attorneys and his chief of staff and stuff like this, that when Trump came into office, he had a ragtag bunch of malcontents and miscreants working with him, along with a few relatively, I don't want to say august, but somewhat substantive figures like Tillerson, who was the mm-hmm. secretary of state. Mm-hmm. You can make the argument John Kelly was chief of staff, mm-hmm. one or two other people. Mm-hmm. Okay, all those people were soon spun out of their their roles, along with a whole bunch of other cabinet members, for example, were all corrupt and got driven out in various scandals and stuff like this. When we get to the end of the Trump administration, yeah. the people that are working for him are the bottom of the barrel. Yeah, they're the, the day graders. So you hear things like Mark Meadows, the chief of staff of the White House, is like, I, I even forget what he is. He's this nobody congressman from North Carolina, I think. Mm-hmm. His main claim to fame was starting or being a founding member of the Freedom Con, um, the Freedom Caucus and the House yeah. of Representatives, who are a bunch of right-wing nut jobs. Mm-hmm. Okay, you have people like um, the Secretary of State Pompeo, who is a nobody from Kansas, and all of a sudden he's Secretary of State. You have all these kind of second and third tier people that all of a sudden are put up. And so during the January 6th hearings, when you have this line of people, like even Cassidy Hutchison, God bless her heart, mm-hmm. I mean... Here's this young woman, she seemed to be Republican, working in the White House for four years and finally going, oh, wait a minute. Mm. <laughs> Things were going on that weren't right. Yeah. And I'm, I'm really glad that she testified the way she did and stuff like this. But remember, these are people who have, um, who either A, aren't that bright, B, are actually malevolent, C, have screws loose, mm. D, just living in a bubble and just thinking any of this stuff that was going on during the Trump administration was okay. So let's really remember that these are not substantive people in the Republican Party. There's no James Baker. There's no eminent grease, you know, behind the scenes that are helping him. Um, there's just a bunch of grubby little people. Well, I'll, what, just, I'll just jump in at this point and just make the point that as well, that the people we're talking about when we're talking about this indictment aren't even those people that you're referring to because Trump ignored those people, the degraders that were in positions of authority at that point in time, to turn to Sidney Powell and to turn to Jeff Clark, who was this dude who was like, he was like halfway up the environmental... In, in, like He was like this nobody environmental lawyer and he tried to make him the attorney general at one point in time. Like, like he actually, even at the, the point you make, this is true, by the end of his... By the end of his administration, the quality of the staff were of the people in power were significantly lower than when they started. But he ignored them as well. Exactly to move to people like Rudy Giuliani and Sidney Powell and Sidney, yeah. etc. So like, so it's actually the people we're talking about are really they're they you need an excavator to go as low as some of these yeah, people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and people should, just to be clear, this is another thing that doesn't quite get said. When people talk about Jeff Clark, mm. what's so outrageous about it is that there's a criminal decision, this division of the Justice Department and a civil. Mm. And so he was in, A, he was in the civil part, which is a lot different from the criminal. Yeah. And then B, even when it comes to civil, he was in the, he was an environmental lawyer. Yeah. That, that, I mean, this is like having, you know, someone in a far outreach office of some big company being put in charge of some major things who had basically no experience with the big boy stuff or big girl stuff. So, um, but, and that's exactly what I was getting at. So you have all these people who testified against him Mm. were the dregs of the dregs. Mm. And then he had to go down to even a farther level. So, Mm. so when you hear these people, it's not like Nick, I mean, Nixon for all his, I mean, well, for all the faults, but, but Nixon, Haldeman, Ehrlichman, I mean, they were a cabal. They were sitting in Mitchell, right? They were all sitting there deciding what to do, planning crimes and getting it executed. Mm. Okay. And they were, for better or worse, they were Nixon's inner circle for the whole, basically all of his presidency. And um, three of those four went to jail mm. and the fourth should have. And so, um, so just remember that this time, this isn't like this. This is just a bunch of complete bozos running in and out. And even the bozos in residence couldn't even countenance it. And so you have Trump avoiding the bozos in residence and going for the bozos outside who were insurrectionists and crazies. Mm-hmm. And of course, as we've seen, are all getting disbarred and driven out of the legal um, profession mm-hmm. and may indeed fe- face actual imprisonment, okay? Um, so that's just something to remember. I just It just bothers me sometimes. You just see, oh, you know, the Secretary of State, it's like, he, he's not a guy. You know, yeah. these people aren't serious people. Um, and they're all testifying against him. Yes. And we don't know yet. I mean, I'll get to this in a second. Forget about the unindicted conspir- or the possibly indicted conspirators. Another thing, just to remember all this talk about the deep state, just for the record, there is no deep state, mm. okay? I I was in Washington during the 2000s, right? I, le- I lived across the street from the FBI, okay? I lived in one of those, you know, all the buildings in D.C. are 10 or 12 stories high, right? And it had a gym, 
Okay, nice gym and stuff like that. And every day after work, the gym was full of FBI people, men and women, okay? And they were all muscled and they were red in the face and they all had Fox News blaring, okay? Now, that is an anecdote, okay? But I think it's a pretty indicate, good indication of what the FBI is like. I mean, we're talking across the street from the FBI in a gym, populated large by FBI agents, yeah. they all had Fox News. The idea that there's this leftist contingent in the FBI or these places going after Republicans or something like that is completely silly. Now, you did have people, quote unquote, going after Trump when he was running for office, mm. but it was based on, you know, relatively persuasive evidence and reasons. They had a counterintelligence um, file opened up on him, blah, blah, blah. And you can argue about some of the fine points of it. But for the record, they were responding to actual criminality. It wasn't like, oh, we don't like him because he's a Republican, because they're all Republicans. Mm. Okay. I, I think until it's fair to say that until 10 years ago, the FBI was almost exclusively associated with being Republican. Like no one even thought. But it to, still is. Every no, FBI I, I'm, director I'm not, I'm not is, saying yeah. it's not. I'm just, yeah. saying, I'm just saying that no one would even thought to, it would have been a laughable talking point up to 10 years ago. People yeah. saying, oh yeah, they're, they're this left-wing hotbed of anarchists. Like it's just the, it's, it, it would have been a laughable. Now, now you and I have, have different views about all kinds of things. And the, and I, I'm probably have a, a, um, I'm probably harsher on some of the actions that, that individual FBI agents took during the, um, during the Russiagate period. Like I think that there was some really poor work from some of those FBI agents. I, I, I disagree with you about, about, um, that, 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 Every that, that that when people took actions, it was always with you know high degrees of evidence and stuff like. I think some of them were did not do good things. I think the Inspector General uh, uh, made a, in his report pointed out a few examples. I don't want to get into that now. What we totally agree with though is that is in no way indicative of an overall culture of the FBI. Yeah. You can have duds and hacks, and but that doesn't mean everyone is a dud and a hack. Yeah, you know, and and yeah, uh, and my, I agree. my personal experience, I, like you've. You've worked at NPR. I worked at the ABC. My per I've worked in a bureaucracy. I know what a bureaucracy is like. And the, the idea that they could, could march in lockstep with a, any kind of government, let, let alone left-wing or right-wing, wherever, is just impossible. There is a culture in a bureaucracy. I, I definitely think that's the case. Yeah. And, but that culture is it's, it's very unique to that particular bureaucracy. They don't all share a culture, that's for sure. And on, on top of that, it's usually quite opposed to anyone who's in charge. They have their own little thing. Now, now some might say, oh, that is the deep state. But, what, but, but there's no conspiracy about that. There's no people trying to, they don't care about what's going on above them. Yeah. They care about their little fiefdoms. That's what they care about. They, they piss and moan amongst each other. Like uh, one department fights against another department and so forth. They don't right. care exactly. about who's yeah, in charge. Bureaucratic warfare. Like at the ABC, I, I, and I, I know this from personal experience, like not, people out there watching this will might find this hard to believe, but no one in the ABC gives a shit who, whether it's a liberal government or labor government, they're arguing against each other. Yeah. Like the entertainment department wants the documentary department's funding. The, you know, like it, it's the, it, that, that is the culture of a bureaucracy. Yeah. And like it's uh and I and I don't think unless you work in the bureaucracy you can really understand that. Now I know America might be different, but I bet it is. Yeah, no, I'm sure it's like that, <laughs> and that's exactly it. And there, there, you could make all sorts of things. Like one thing that I think one analogy, if I were going to make an analogy, I think it'd almost be something like a a transplant where the body is rejecting it. Mm -hmm. So when you have a bozo like Trump who comes mm -hmm. in or just someone who obviously has so many economic and social um, issues in his past that makes him unfit to hold office and stuff like this mm -hmm. you could sort of see an organ rejection kind of thing going and the and the body politic coming together to say oh we have to watch this guy mm -hmm. but again that's not a deep state and that's just something natural and that comes with the thing when you're basically a rich person and a criminal and a moral mm -hmm. vacuum and you've done so many um things before and during the campaign and after well and also um, also he he went to war with the fbi really early on yeah like what a surprise that they that they might not trust him. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, anyway and he was a bad and he's also a bad manager administrator. I mean, <laughs> think how much damage he could have done <laughs> if he'd just been quiet, got his people around and said, Okay, let's figure this place out for six months and let's go to work. Mm. And he didn't do that. Anyway. Okay, it's just another thing to yeah, remember. Other, yeah. Um and just this is another 
pet peeve I have in coverage that when you and and all the media does this. Well, mm. the Republicans believe, or there's many people who still believe that, mm. da, da, that they really don't believe that they say it. Mm. Okay, there are things that they say, and mm. I just kind of hate that nomenclature. And um, ninety percent of the people, and I lived in Arizona. I know a lot of these people. I lived in Washington. I lived in Washington largely during Republican administration. Mm. I think I mentioned it before. A very high Republican official lived next door to me, and and. Um, you know, so I think it's fair. I I knew actual Republicans, and the the type of people we're dealing with now really aren't Republicans. They're sort of they're operating in bad faith, and a lot of what they say they don't believe. And just keep that in mind that when you hear people say, "Oh, they believe, still believe the election was stolen," they really don't. They're just saying that for a political gain and to keep the Yahoos um, um, upset. All, all I would say about that is that, like I, I I mean I'm someone who has spoken for years about the about the saying that yeah, Donald Trump and the Trumpists aren't actually conservatives. You know, like I'm someone who has a lot of sympathy with a lot of conservative politics and yeah. they don't, they don't reflect conservative politics at all. And if anything, they're quite radical in yeah. a lot of different ways. Right. But I, I do think at some point in time, and I'm, I'm not quite there yet, but I'm getting close at some point in time, you, you need to say, well, the, what, what is a Republican has changed? What what oh. what you used to think was a Repu- what what used to be a Republican is no longer was a Republican, and the people who say I'm the real Republican and he's not the real Republican, they're getting to the point where they're not the real Republicans anymore because ninety percent of the Republican Party are with Trump. Yeah, well, <laughs> like, and so yeah, and so at some point in time we need to update our definitions of what is a Republican and what isn't. Yeah, and I, I think really we're, I think we're getting pretty close to, to that point. Well, it's. Yeah. That's kind of it's such an interesting point because it has been taken over and so many of the precepts of the Republican Party have been abandoned, obviously. I mean, the idea of a competent foreign policy, fiscal conservatism, um, staying out of people's personal lives. I mean, um, there have been some um, animations ever since the Reagan administration on abortion and certain things like this. You've always had anti-homosexual views, but you've also had a, a, a part of the Republican Party that was libertarian and basically had a live and let live philosophy. And all of that is gone. Um if during the Reagan era, remember it was like, oh, Republicans are so optimistic, and Democrats aren't. They're also <laughs> going now. Look at Trump, well, you know. Strange, and then, yeah. um, and then when you look over the past administrations, um, uh, stewardship of the economy, of course, mm-hmm. like the def- the deaf Senator Reagan exploded mm-hmm. under Bush, it exploded under Trump, it exploded. Yeah. The mismanagement of the wars under Bush, the mismanagement of foreign policy under Trump, all these things are violations of traditional Republican goals. And then what's so disturbing is, let's say that's like 40% of the party who just goes for that. But then you have this other 30 or 40% who's just been going along, yeah. like who can't bring themselves to detach. Yeah. Um, so that's another thing I want to talk about under the thing, because you know, the one, then the question is, why aren't they just going over to the other side? Mm. We'll get to that. Yeah. Um, two quick other things. One yeah. thing, to, another thing to remember is that from here on in, there's there's Trump versus <laughs> the rest of the world, okay, the rest of the universe, basically. Mm-hmm. And we have to remember they're playing two different games. So the Justice Department is pursuing legally. They're going to have to go under legal strictures. They're going to deal with the courts based on decades of ways of dealing with these um, judges and justices, et cetera, et cetera. Trump is actually not really fighting in court, right? He's no. fighting in the court of public opinion. Yeah. And we have to realize that, you know, he's he, it, we've seen this already. He sends these phalanxes of bozos out just saying all these outrageous things. Remember Kellyanne Conway saying, oh, there's alternative facts, right? And you go, oh, my God. Now you have this guy saying, oh, well, he technically violated the Constitution. And you go, really? And then you go, oh, what he was doing was aspirational. It wasn't a crime. And you go, well, actually, the crime is aspirational. Like when you're trying to overthrow an election, that's a crime. And so you get all these people throwing out these word salads and throwing out these these completely nonsensical and um, sometimes devilishly clever malapropisms and inventions. Um, that that's and it's not really. I don't know if you saw the editorial cartoon. There was a cartoon with Jack Smith and Trump playing chess, and Jack Smith was sitting on one side of it, scowling at the board, and he had all his chessmen aligned, and then Trump was on the other side, and he had a single red checker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's really what's happening legally, I yeah. think. Yeah. Um, but of course, this whole other battle is going, and so we have to remember that two separate things. And I wish the coverage kind of mentioned that, you know, that that. Um, it's hard, you know, it's exhausting. But that's another thing I keep remembering. You read these things about Trump, it'll say, well, Trump is under fire legally. And then it talks for like 18 paragraphs about all these insane political things he's doing. And so there are, it's not three dimensional chess versus checkers or anything like that. They're just in two different universes. Mm-hmm. And what most of us are hoping is that ultimately um, the legal thing is going to take over. And that was my last point, 
which is remember that um, there are flaws in the American political system, in the Justice Department, the FBI, and stuff like this. But at this point, you've had this administration. It's been in office now for, what, two and a half years? Um, yeah, at least. And um, at some point, the full weight of the United States Justice Department started lying, mm -hmm. and they brought in this guy from the War Crimes Tribunal in The Hague. And um, he has innumerable FBI people and Justice Department employees and an unlimited budget. Yeah. And... Um, it, it got going slow and anything could happen, but boy, you know, these are people who know what they're up against. They've seen this guy operate now for the past seven years, and so they came to play. And so that's another thing to remember is that, that there's a really, really big aircraft carrier that kind of finally turned around and is bearing down on Trump, who's in a little dinghy with some red MAGA flags. <laughs> and um, God knows anything could happen. Maybe he has some mysterious little thing he could hit the aircraft carrier with, but... Um, but it is a very one-sided fight in a lot of ways. So that's what we're going to see coming up. That's my position. Talking about the legal things, I'll just, I'll just get into a couple of points. On yeah, what do you say? First of all, um, there's an argument that I've seen in the last week being used a number of times. I've seen it in National Review. I've seen it from a few of the more sort of intellectual sort of conservative outlets, um, suggesting that uh, most of these charges involve fraud. The, uh, in some respect, and that they and that Jackson Smith essentially doesn't understand how the law works with fraud, and they're going to be dismissed, or they're or he's going to be found not guilty because fraud doesn't work. And even if he wins, it'll be overturned on appeal by the Supreme Court because it's contradicting Supreme Court precedent on what fraud is. What they're referring to in particular is that there's been a whole bunch of cases involving criminal fraud or wire fraud, where um, they, uh, including in the Supreme Court just a few weeks ago which held that fraud in federal criminal law is a scheme to swindle victims out of money or tangible property. And there needs to be money or property involved. And in this case, there's neither money nor property involved. And so fraud is the wrong charge, right? The, uh, and the fraud against the United States, for instance, is the wrong charge because fraud needs to involve either money or physical property. And since it involves neither, he can't be found guilty. That's an argument that gets used. Okay. Now, that's bullshit. Okay, that is bullshit. And I'll tell you why that's bullshit. Um, what I just described is correct if he was charged with criminal fraud, straight fraud, or wire fraud, or all kinds of frauds. They, they often have that phrase, uh, money or tangible property, in the actual legislation. They don't in fraud against the United States. And the Supreme Court, many courts, including the Supreme Court, have held repeatedly that Section 371, which is the one they've charged him under, has nothing to do with the other kinds of frauds. They have different tests. They're completely different charges. So one cannot be applied to the other. The Supreme Court has explicitly held that. In 2016, they unanimously held that. Okay, so that's including Justice Thomas and Alito and all those guys. Okay, they've already set a precedent that 371, the one that's been charged, has nothing to do with money or property. Okay, so forget that. Um, and I'll even read you a quote. This is from 1987 case, McNally, the Supreme Court, uh, court a case which, which defined exactly what Section 371 covers. Uh, to conspire to defraud the United States means primarily to cheat the government out of property or money. It also means to interfere with or obstruct one of its lawful governmental functions by deceit, craft, or trickery, or at least by means that are dishonest, which sounds to me exactly what Trump attempted, particularly with the fake electors, which I keep on thinking is the, the main area. The fake electors, I think, is the one where they've really got a lot of evidence. My concern I expressed last week was that a lot of the evidence that we saw in the indictment doesn't point at Trump. It points at Giuliani and it points at Cheesebro and it points at a bunch of other guys. But my hope, if you, well, to the extent that you want Trump convicted, you're going you're gonna to hope that they have evidence that they didn't present in the indictment tying Trump to that scheme. Mm -hmm. right? the, uh, because that scheme, I think, is a perfect example of why I just read out. The, uh, which is yeah, which is section three seven one. Yeah, can I mention one thing? Yes, yes. and I, this kind of goes into what I was saying too. I totally agree with you that there's mm -hmm. so much commentary on this, and it's actually a really great time mm -hmm. in journalism in a way, like particularly with podcasts and stuff like this, because you have so many heavy duty Justice Department people, serious lawyers who do yeah. podcasts, and yeah. and a lot of them are very fair and very. Yeah. Um, but balanced and um, pretty um, illuminating when it comes to all this. Um, but again, 
you, you know, when I read that National Review article, mm. which, which um, put this, you kind of go, well, what are the chances that the United States Justice Department mm. going up against a former, you know, president mm. of the United States, you know, goes at this thing and they go, oh, darn, you're right. Yeah. We totally got that wrong. We got <laughs> yeah. Andrew, what was his name? Andrew McCarthy? Yeah. Andrew oh, McCarthy. Andy got us again. <laughs> Damn it. You know, yeah, yeah. you just kind of, some of these things, when you see these hot takes, these pronouncements yeah. about things like that. Um, I would take them, all of them, with just a tiny bit of grain of salt because um, there's some very, very serious, and that's not to say they can't screw up, they can't say they're not going to lose the case, but boy, these kind of glib um, pronouncements, I think, are a little scary. I think that's true. Uh, And while I'm at it, another one that gets thrown around is the Section 241, that's the conspiracy to to, to deprive people of their rights. There's a lot of people saying, oh, that's a civil war law about the KKK, and he's and he's completely misappropriating it to be about this election. Like the, uh, uh, it's long been used about fraud in elections. Like there's, I, I read an article with with a very lengthy list of of uh, case scenarios where Section Two Four One has been used in the past over the last hundred years, over and over and over again. We're talking about. It's been used for stopping the counting of votes, stealing votes, destroying votes, creating false votes, creating slight, fake slates of votes, which is exactly what the fake electors are. Right? It's been used in all the in all the, the scenarios we've got now. It's been used before. Right? So, so Section two four one is absolutely an appropriate charge right. as and, well. And I believe it's this one. Forgive me if I don't have it right. Where one of the justices at one point said. Um, not having your vote counted is exactly equivalent to not being able to vote. It's yes. the same denial of rights. Totally. So this is a case where they were trying to not have these votes counted yes. or not or make them invalid. And so it seems to fall very clearly within that. Totally. And again, it's obvious that the people have spent a year some of the smartest lawyers in the country yeah. figuring out how, what are the ones that are going to work? They've thought these things through. Again, we could see some pitfalls. However, yeah. um, you're right. They yeah. wouldn't have taken these charges lightly. <laughs> okay. Next thing is belief as a general area. What Trump believes, what he doesn't believe. That's been a, a, a very hot topic. We talked about it at length uh, last week as well. Um, I just want to just go back to that just for one moment because I feel like there are two, two arms to this question. One of which is, I think, the one I have, I think is rational, and one is is complete irrational, and they're being confused together. The one in public, being argued in public, is the irrational one. So I just want to point out what that is, which is um, people saying Trump needs, they need to prove that Trump believed that he lost the election in order to win. That is not true. That's absolutely not true. Um, I was very careful last week to say that is not what I am suggesting, it doesn't matter whether Trump thinks he won the election or not. Um, what I'm personally concerned about, the other arm, which is what I'm concerned about, is proving his state of mind for each specific action that he took. That's the issue. But what was his state of mind about the action, the activity that he took? Was it a fraudulent action or not? Not ov- Overall, it doesn't matter what he thinks. Right? Like you can, you're, it's not okay to do something dodgy in pursuit of a noble aim. Like if you, if you, if you think that uh, it's not like, you can't say, Oh, I, I, uh, the, the bank, the bank has made an error in my favor. So uh, so it it made an error in my account. So I can therefore rob the bank to get the money back. Even though the overall aim is correct. When you, the actual action, if you know it's illegal, then that is, or, or, or dishonest or whatever, that is a crime. Right. And so, to me, it's a, it's about the belief that Trump had in the individual actions that he took. Did, was he intentionally undertaking in a conspiracy or not? That's the yeah. question for me about belief. Not did he believe overall it was in, in service of a noble aim or not. All right. And so I just want to just distinguish between and, those two. And one quick thing. I yeah. think that the operative phrase in a lot of those is the phrase corrupt intent. Yes. Which is a different way of saying the same thing. And it's totally. just and it's completely different from believe it or not, is that are you doing something for a corrupt purpose? Yeah. And yeah. And um, one other thing, I, what a lot of commentators compare this to is the the second O.J. Simpson case. If you recall why O.J. Simpson was in prison ultimately yeah. is because he some people had some of his memorabilia and he thought it was his, right? Yeah. So he got a bunch That's of right. bozos, they all got guns, and they <laughs> held the guy up. And he might have believed it was his or not, but you can't go back and get what you want. Exactly. Guns. And I should say that this, this argument, the, the stupid argument that I thought the election was rigged, therefore I can do whatever the hell I want, 
is an argument used by many January 6 defendants who have gone to jail. <laughs> many January 6 Hundreds. defendants yeah, have, gone, have said, well, the election was rigged. Yeah, but that's, and you may well have thought the election was rigged, but that's not an excuse to riot. You may, you may not have thought the election was legit, but you knew for a fact that you were rioting. Right? And that is what you're going to jail for, the rioting. And that's another key yeah. thing with the indictment, too, is that if you think the election is rigged, you should protest. Mm. You should file legal yeah. support. You should give money for legal things and stuff like that, but you shouldn't break into the Capitol. And, um, and that's the same thing they make very clear in the indictment about Trump, that there's all these legal things that he steps he could have taken. He mm. took them all and he lost them all. Yeah. So anyway, so, so, just, to, so just to just hammer home what I'm saying, take Section 371, that, that definition I read from before from the Supreme Court to interfere with or obstruct one of its lawful government functions by deceit, craft, or trickery, or at least by means of dishonest. To be deceitful or dishonest, you have to know you are being deceitful or dishonest. Yeah. That is what I think they need to prove, right? Yeah. And my concern is that I didn't see proof of that leaping out at me from the indictment sheet. I saw proof of that from Giuliani, from Eastman, from Jeff Clark, from Cheesebro, all the co-conspirators I saw, I saw evidence of that. But Trump was, all, was in, at least in the indictment sheet, often one step removed. And they, and they need to show, if they want Trump to, to be convicted, they need to show that he had that intent. Right? And that, that is what my concern is. Now, I'm not saying I'm 100% right. That's my concern. I'm no expert on American law. Right? I do have a law degree. I, I can read a case. But I'm not, I'm, like, there, are, there are experts who are disagreeing about this right now. Honest, good faith disagreements. Okay, so I might be wrong about that, but I, I just want to just be very clear about what, what exactly I'm saying. And that, that is going to be argued in court, almost certainly, and probably will be argued by the Supreme Court at some point in time if he's convicted, right? Um, one thing we should add to that is a question which I asked, I'm not sure if we've even put it on the air. I don't remember what, 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 we, what we edited. On Planet America, we interviewed a lawyer, um, the uh, American lawyer about this. And one of the questions I asked her was, Willful blindness. What's the role of willful blindness here? Can you, to, to, to show intent or knowledge on, on, on Trump's part, can you argue willful blindness? That a reasonable per, per person would have, would have known that what he was doing was, was, was not kosher and he had to deny it in an irrational way in order to, to participate. And like she didn't really answer. So I had a look. I looked up knowingly and willfully in the American Government Criminal Resource Manual. And this is what you get. Regard, reckless disregard of whether a statement is true or a conscious effort to avoid learning the truth can be construed as acting knowingly. Now, that's a bit bush lawyer me looking up the, the, the criminal resource manual, but that sounds to me what, like what Trump did. Yeah. Okay, so whether, so whether in the end that is a critical part of making the case against him or not, I don't know. I just want to flag that. that, that I think that's going to be an area of interest. Where, 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 yeah. What exactly counts as knowingly or not knowingly, right? Can I mention one quick thing? Yeah. I think that's a great observation. I think that's yeah. really smart because we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. I think the way I would contextualize that a little bit is that mm -hmm. this is something that's going to go to the jury. Yeah. And the jury's just going to have to decide. Yeah. And I have to tell you, reading that indictment, I've read it a couple times mm -hmm. now, it just kind of felt like mm -hmm. it's, you know, and again, anything can happen with the jury, but I think they have a case to make. Yeah. They'd say, look it. The guy lost the election. Fox News said they lost. His attorney general, the guys around him, the next guy, the next guy, the next guy, they all said he asked him this. They went, like there are literally, I mean, two dozen iterations of he wanted this. They said no, he went to this. And at a certain point, the, the, the case I think is going to go on not on, on exactly that point, but the way it's going to come down is the jury of it, it going to say, yeah, it's very clear what happened, you yeah. know, or can it get to the point where they can cause some problems? One point that I haven't seen raised yet, and I really don't know, is that on a lot of these defenses, do they need to have him testify? I was just about to say that. I was just about to well, say Well, you take that. But, now, you know, Bill, Bill Barr, when you mentioned the Attorney General, I was going to say, there's going to be a lot of testifying going on, and one of them will probably be Bill Barr. Um, Bill Barr, made exactly this point. He, he said that, and I think it's a good point. He said, if you want to make either, either the what he truly believed defense or he was relying on counsel defense, which is another one which has been mentioned, he said both of them require testimony from the person himself. And he said, that's why I don't think they'll go with other, either defense because if you put him on the stand, he is going to be cross-examined and that will not end well. 
I think that's probably true. Either he's going to throw the case against himself or he's going to end up in, in jail for perjury for 300 years. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so, so they're going to want to keep him off the stand. So, the, uh, so those defenses may not even be available to him if he's not going to testify himself. Yeah, I think I heard Andrew Weissman, who's a very, who worked on the Mueller mm. report, who's a very smart guy the other day, said, he made some references. He says, he said, any lawyer who put Trump on the stand would be immediately disbarred. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Which I thought was an interesting line. Yeah so, 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 yeah, so all these arguments may well be arguments in the court of public opinion, but not in the court. Yeah. We, we, may, we may find. Uh, the next thing is I want to talk about contempt briefly, which is uh, last week we, Dave and I both said that we suspected Trump wouldn't end up going to jail, whether he was convicted or not. But um, the uh, but I forgot contempt of court, and uh, the, and we've already seen this week the beginnings of a contempt charge against him. Um, the, the court certainly didn't forget contempt of court when they at the arraignment they explicitly gave him a warning they didn't give anyone else which was uh, I want to remind you that it's a crime to try to influence a juror or to threaten or attempt to bribe a witness or any other person who may have information about your case or to retaliate against anyone for providing information about your case to the prosecution or to otherwise obstruct the administration of justice they don't normally say that but they said that to him so obviously they're thinking about contempt um, and then of course he went away and immediately tweeted out, if you go after me, I'm coming after you, which could be interpreted as a threat, I would have thought. Um, do, would you interpret it as a threat? Absolutely. And then he, <laughs> and then he attacked a witness. Yes, I'm all against to that. And, uh, and, they, he, uh, and the, I, I should say the spokesperson, Trump's spokesperson said that wasn't about the case at all. Quote, the truth post cited is the definition of political speech. It was in response to the rhino, China-loving, dishonest special interest groups and super PACs like the ones funded by the Koch brothers and the Club for No Growth. I'm sure the that's what it was no about. Yeah, I'm sure that's what it was about. Um, Jack Smith's office applied for an immediate protective order as soon as that came out. Uh, they said all the proposed order seeks to prevent is the improper dissemination or use of discovery materials included to the, including to the public. Such a restriction is particularly important in this case because the defendant has previously issued public statements on social media regarding witnesses, judges, attorneys, and others, others associated with legal matters p- pending against him. Now, I must admit, I don't see him essentially threatening the judge <laughs> as necessarily being directly connected to that, although it might be through witnesses, like implicitly witnesses. Um, but I do think the concern they raise is very real. <laughs> the concern, of, the concern oh, right. of, of Trump leaning on witnesses and, 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 and so forth. Um, uh, now, Trump's legal team, they responded by asking that the order just shields only genuine sens- genuinely sensitive materials from public view. So Trump can share non-sensitive, potentially expo- ex- exculpatory evidence. He needs to put his, that evidence out, they said, so he can seek the help of volunteer attorneys or others without paid employment arrangements. Imagine, imagine being his theoretically paid lawyers and typing out that sentence, having to argue that Trump needs to be able to consult edgelords on Twitter and nut jobs like Sidney Powell instead of listening to you, the person who is typing out this statement right now. That's what he's saying. He's saying he wants to be able to listen to people other than his lawyer. His lawyer wants to, has to argue. It's a very strange situation his lawyer is in. Anyway, um, it's like reading out your own suicide note if you're that lawyer. (laughs) It's just like, this is how my career will end (laughs) by this process. Um, they also argued that the government is seeking to restrict Trump's First Amendment rights in a case about First Amendment rights and that Biden has somehow already exploited this indictment by releasing a short social media video promoting his new range of merchandise, which is a mug with the words Dark Brandon on it. I, I know it's part of the Constitution that Trump has to respond to any allegation against him with a what about Biden, but that's a particularly big stretch, Crazy, I would have thought. Yeah. Anyway, but to, and also, by the way, that First Amendment suggestion, that, the, that <clears throat> this case is about the First Amendment, that is the stupidest argument I've heard yet. Absolutely. That, that, like that, that Trump has a First Amendment right to commit crimes. That is, that is not the case. And that's, exactly. the, that's the shortest path to a conviction if, if they want to use that argument. I don't think they will use yeah, that Yeah, it's argument. really true. And yeah. the other level on which it's a ridiculous thing is that when you're out on bail, you don't have First Amendment rights. Yeah. Like, 
it's it's like he does have the right to say that, but then he can lose his bail. Like that's the point true. isn't that's that true. he's stopping him from yeah. doing it. They're just saying, look at as a condition of your bail, you're doing this. Yeah, and which is a very well defined um, um, exception to First Amendment. That's right. right. Anyway, Smith then responded by saying the central purpose of criminal discovery is to provide the defendant with materials necessary to prepare for a fair trial. The defendant instead proposed an order designed to allow him to try this case in the media rather than the courtroom. To safeguard witness privacy and integrity of these proceedings, the court should enter the government's proposed protection, protective order. I think it's pretty hard to argue with that. That is exactly what he did. He, he, yeah. he said he wanted to consult free attorneys, attorneys um, you know, who aren't actual attorneys. He means the public, right? Um, anyway, um, and then as if to show how desperately he wants to be gagged, Trump then posts... There is no way, in caps, there is no way I can get a fair trial with a judge assigned to this ridiculous freedom of speech fair elections case. Everybody knows it, and so does she. Okay. Now, there is no conclusion to this yet. They're still, they're still making motions, and they're, there's going to be hearing about this. I'm not, I must admit, that if you go after me, I'm coming after you. I was happy to give him the ban for the doubt on that one, because even though we all know what he meant, the exact words weren't a direct threat against the judge. You know, they could use their little, we're talking about the club for no growth thing, yeah. right? That one there, there's no ban for the doubt about. That is, that is bullying and as bullying a judge and being disrespectful to the court, uh, I would say it's almost contemptuous of the court, yeah. wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> so that's, uh, I, I don't know the ins and outs of American contempt law. I'm not going to pretend I do. If this was Australia, he's in jail right now. Yeah. I'm telling you that. Now, I know in America with the, with, the, with the First Amendment and all the rest of it, you get a little bit more free speech. But at some point in time, if you're going to abuse a judge like that, you're going to go to jail, even in America. Yeah. And the, uh, I, I, I can't help wondering. It's really tough for the judge, I think, actually. And this is why I, I want to know your view on. What's a judge do? Because on one hand, you don't want to have a double standard. Right, like, and, and someone else is going to jail if they keep on doing this, right? If they're not the president or the ex-president. Uh, but on the other hand, I can't help thinking that Trump might want to be charged. Yeah, it would, create another, it would create another thing. Yeah. Can I- he, 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 he can use that to say the judge is biased. That can be his proof that the judge is out to get me. The yeah. trial is rigged. And it can help him raise money. It can help him, it can help him aggravate his crowd and then apply extra pressure to the court. You know, like, so it might only help him if you send him to jail. So I don't actually know what the, what the smart thing to do yeah. is there. So I, I think that's a really good point. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you, you know, all of us are so exhausted. We want, we want the judge to rein him in at the beginning yeah. rather than later. Yeah. Um, I, when I think about this, it makes my head hurt. And I had just had one final comment on this whole thing, maybe yeah. before we move to the election, which is that the next 16 months are going to be so painful mm. because he is just, it is just going to be Trump, Trump, Trump. It's going to be, Trump said this, what's the judge going to do? Oh, the judge put him in contempt of court. Oh, yeah. is he going to get put in jail for three days? What's the secret service going to do? What, you know, and he's going to suck up all the volume. Mm. There's going to be some debates. Is Trump going to be there? Is he going to be in jail? Can he mm. get out of jail to be in the debate? Is he going to show up in the last minute? It's mm. like going to be like that. It's going to be so exhausting the next 16 months. And every single debate, every single thing, oh, is he in trial? Is there a motion? Is it going to get postponed? Is he going to testify? Is Giuliani flipping? Is Meadows yeah, flipping? Yeah, what did yeah. Trump say about Meadows? Is that an <laughs> attack on a witness? What's the judge going to do? Oh my God, there's another debate. Did you see what Chris Christie said about Trump? <laughs> yeah. It's just going to be like that for the next 16 months. It will. And we could come down to this crazy thing 14 months from now. We're on the eve of an election and you could have at least, you could have two mm. trials. We're waiting to hear what, what, whether he's going to be guilty or not, conceivably we could have something where he's sentenced to prison on the eve of an election. Mm. We could have where he's sentenced to prison after the election, but before the inauguration. Yeah. And it's just going to be insane. And, and he really does have this otherworldly ability to suck all the, the attention out of a room and put on himself in the most incredibly flamboyant way. And it's really a mark of genius in a certain yeah. way. And who would have thought we that this would happen? That he A, he would be that he'd be indicted for an insurrection basically for trying to overthrow the peaceful transfer of power. And the first thing he does is we're all sitting there is the judge gonna throw him in prison yeah. for contempt of court. Yeah. And um um now the one thing I will notice is mm. that Jack Smith and those guys, they have it all teed up. They, they know what he's going to do next. Yeah. And these, I think what they're doing is they're basically just hitting send on a whole bunch of motions. <laughs> they have them all teed up. Yeah. And the judge, you know, saying, hey, let me know by 9 p.m. Let me know by Friday. I don't think the judge is going to be putting up with it. Mm -hmm. um, but I agree with you that it really could be. Because at this point, he's put out a general threat. He's attacked a witness, Mike mm -hmm. Pence. He's yeah. attacked the judge. So mm -hmm. right now he's done three things. Yeah. And... Um, 
And in a certain way, if nothing else, the judge is going to offer the protective order. And the protective order is just to keep keep um, some of the information discovery away from Trump. And it puts the onus on his lawyers, which, of course, he'll throw under the bus. Oh, and another thing that we're going to see is also, will he throw his lawyers under the bus? Will he say, oh, it was Giuliani's idea? Was it Eastman's idea? Stuff like that. Mm. So that's going to be hilarious. And all those people might be on trial at the same time. Mm. That's the other thing I forgot to mention, yeah. is that there could be a debate and we could have Giuliani on the stand, you know, defending himself, throwing Trump under the bush. Yeah. I mean, it's just crazy. Yeah. I was trying to lawyers. I, I actually suspect this area is probably the area where he's going to lose his current lawyers because they're already disagreeing, where Trump is saying he is demanding in capitals for the judge to recuse herself. Um, the, uh, and the lawyer is saying, no, 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 that's not our position. Like the lawyers, it was already contradicting him in public, saying that's not our position. We need to be very careful with those kinds of statements. Like Trump's not going to like that because and, that's his talking point at the moment. So uh, I think he's going to sack the lawyer real soon based on that. Yeah. And I, yeah. and I think I read something where someone serious was saying, in theory, the judge can basically stop him from tweeting. Or he could say, yeah. the, she could say that the lawyers have to vet everything he tweets, which mm. is just going to create another. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Um, I, 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 one thought is about the unhinged posting, by the way. It's possible that he actually is restraining himself at the moment. The reason why I say that is because you look at some of his other posts at the moment, like the one about Nancy Pelosi. Did you see that one? Mm -hmm. the one? The one where Nancy Pelosi said, I'll read the quote from Nancy Pelosi. I wasn't in the courtroom, of course, but when I saw him, Trump, coming out of his car and this or that, I saw a scared puppy. He looked very, very concerned about the fate. I don't, didn't see any bravado or confidence or anything like that. He knows he knows the truth that he lost the election and now he's going to face the music. That was her quote. It's not a nice quote. But it's hardly yeah, excessive. Yeah. And his response was, I purposely didn't comment on Nancy Pelosi's very weird story concerning her husband, but now I can because she said something about me with glee that really was really quite vicious. I saw a scared puppy, she said, as she watched me on television like millions of others that didn't see that. I wasn't scared. Nevertheless, how mean a thing to say. She is a wicked witch whose husband's journey from hell starts and finishes with her. She's a sick and demented psycho who will someday live in hell, <laughs> he writes in response. To that. Now, now that's so over the top. And I kind of thinking that one of the reasons why it might be so over the top is because he's, he's getting so worked up and restraining himself from what he says about the trial yeah. that he's... He's, he's venting on everyone else. And so that's, a, 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 I might be wrong about that, but I actually think that might be what's going on in his head. Mm. That he's actually, for him, on good behavior, even with these these three contempt <laughs> instances that you cited. And he's, and, and he's taking out Nancy Pelosi. Although, there's an argument that could be used that Nancy Pelosi is the reason this trial exists. Because if you recall, uh, Merrick Garland did absolutely <clears throat> nothing for a year, except for, except for prosecute bozos. <laughs> who have no power whatsoever. He completely ignored Trump. And then Nancy Pelosi shamed the Department of Justice into an investigation with the January 6th commission. Yeah. And like, and, and that's the reason why, because actually I'll just say this. One, the way, one area I agree with Trump 100% on is that it's incredibly unfair that this election, so that this trial is in the middle of an election when it could have happened a year ago. Like he's right. They did nothing for a year after January 6th. They appoint a special counsel after almost two years and then having a trial in the middle of an election. Yeah. This Nothing has happened in the last three years to, to cause this trial to be now. It, they could have charged him in 2022, easily, easily in 2022, but they did nothing. Merrick Garland did zero for the first 12 months, which is why it's now funny that he's acting like Joe Biden is controlling Merrick Garland to get him because Merrick Garland... Merrick Garland's hopelessness is the reason why this trial is so late. Yeah, and that's why how, I, agree, I totally agree with you. And yeah. that's a perfect example of a lot of the way they work the refs and stuff like that. Yeah. I would just say that we don't really know exactly what happened, mm. but it does look like that from the outside. Yeah, I agree no, with you. That, that's a fair, a fair qualification. Anyway. Um, uh, so that's all I had to say. Yeah, that's, I, think, I think that's a oh, while. Just one thing a couple of people mentioned to me. I just want to make yeah. clear. The United States can and will imprison him. If he is found guilty, which he might be in one of these cases... He could be sentenced to jail, and oh, I don't know. It who can was. be there no, is... but I mean, like people are saying, "Oh, that just can't happen." I mean, it literally could happen. <laughs> yes, it could. No, I'm I'm just saying that it is, there is a system in America, mm -hmm. and it 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 doesn't. Um, like I remember, remember when he had COVID before the last election. Mm -hmm. A couple of years said, "Oh, well, they're going to have to postpone the election." Mm -hmm. I said, 
you can't post, you know what I mean? You can't postpone it. Like you just, it's literally not being done. And there are these trials and they have these trials and then there's a jury and then the judge sentences you. And then after that happens, you can appeal, but then but, you go to jail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I was going to say, he, he's going to appeal and, and, and all those, and you, you, he may end up in jail at some point in time. But I, I would just say, I don't, I don't want to spoil what's coming. But I keep on teasing this Supreme Court section, which I'm going to be talking about with Dave at some point in time, and probably in the next podcast. I am going to spoil it here, just for you, Bill, <laughs> which is I reckon there's a pretty good chance that the person who's going to decide whether Donald Trump goes to jail is Brett Kavanaugh. And, I, and it could be a really, really, really interesting scenario. Yeah. <laughs> a- Do you want to say, I want to specifically disagree. Okay. And the reason is, is that this is something that is really ingrained in the American system. Yeah. Like, like even a radically crazy Supreme Court like mm. this is going to have a really hard time mm. saying, look, there were these crimes. There was a grand jury. He was prosecuted. Mm. There was a jury. The judge that that it's just going to be really hard to 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 overturn that on whatever because the um, the DC circuit is not going to overthrow no, you know not. the thing and so the Supreme Court is going to have to come in at the last minute and say throughout all this whole level of things there was something fundamentally wrong mm-hmm. when he was doing something that we all know was a crime and that we all saw him do in real time and that there's myriad evidence from his own people like mm-hmm. it's just. Like, it's just one, like, there's things like, you know, some of these cases that, that we were talking about, the fraud, like involving the governor mm. of Virginia mm. and even John Edwards, there were these politicians you get corruption and the Supreme Court said, look at this is politics and stuff like that. This isn't politics and quid pro quo. These are, this is a massively documented um, set of crimes, which if the jury decides and the judge decides, it's going to be really hard for the system to buck against. And, and that's just sort of a, a, just a sense of the way the American system works, that it's pretty unusual um, to have something thrown out like that. So I could be wrong, but yeah, just so my sense I. is that it literally could happen it, and it probably It's will. good to get on the record because yeah. at one point in time, we're going to be- We're going to know. We're going to be talking about it. <laughs> going, okay, you want to talk about elections? Yeah, let's just talk about the yeah. election for a yeah. second. Um, okay, here's my hot take, yeah. if I can say, is that the election last year obviously came down to a handful of swim states. Yeah. I just want to get on the record that in the wake of Dobbs, mm-hmm. um, in the insanity of what Trump has done over the last- Two and a half years, mm-hmm. and um, demographic changes. Mm-hmm. Biden's basically decent performance, and the um, the economy. Mm-hmm. It's going to be extraordinarily hard for him to beat Biden. Now there was just that um, there was just the the poll that came out, the New York Times poll last week. Yep. That put them in a dead heat, yep. which I think is amusing. Yep. Okay, we're a long way out from the election. We are a long way People out are election. always dismissive of the president. Mm. There's always this lingering economic issues. He, Biden is not popular. A lot of people think he's too old and things like this. Mm. But we've all seen that, you know, 43, that, you know, I forget what did Trump get in the last election, 46% or 47%, something like that. Something mm. like that. So right now he's at 43. <laughs> and the idea of that getting higher, I think, is very much a long shot, mm. and you are going to have all these other um, uh, political forces, including Dobbs, to discuss with Dobbs, the, the concern about the Supreme Court, um, you know, Biden's decent achievements if they ever get their act together in messaging. Um, I just don't see it. I just don't see anything yet that doesn't suggest it's going to be an easy win for Biden. That's my little production right now, despite that poll, which I just think, I think it was a legitimate poll, of course, and stuff like that. I'm sure people said that, but I just think that there's a reality behind the scenes that doesn't quite... Um, I don't see where Trump gets another 7% of the body politic. Yeah. I, I'm, I must say, I feel like, I mean, this is so early on, but and I wouldn't normally talk about this now, except for you wanted to talk about the election, so I will. <laughs> I, and just to come off what you were saying, my feeling is that Biden has a clear advantage. doesn't mean he's going to win. Like, you know, it, it only takes a recession or a health complaint, uh, in like in October or something like that. Um, to especially you know, with his age going to be such an issue, obviously, um, uh, to you know to lose an election. But I th- definitely think he has the whip hand at this point in time, and I'll tell you why. Um, first of all, I've seen a number of polls now asking Republicans whether they'd vote for Trump if he was convicted of a serious crime, right? which is you know, obviously obviously a pretty realistic hypothetical at this point in time. Um, and you know, there are different numbers like is Ipsos had 35% saying they would to 45%. There have been some where it's like 55% saying they would. But the fact is, if he loses 10% of the Republican vote because of, because of the trials, it's all over. Like, 
The, the, the whole American system revolves around Republicans and Democrats getting about the same number of votes. And then this tiny sliver of independence making the difference. Um, if he loses, yeah, 10, 15% of Republican votes, he's not going to win the election. Trump, I'm talking about. Right? So that, so, so, he, and I, I, I find it difficult to believe that unless the trials, unless, unless, unless there are no trials of any significance whatsoever occurring before the election, uh, or or they or they completely drop the ball the, these prosecutors, then he's going to lose five or ten percent of the vote yeah. of the Republican vote. Well, right. right. And now the only problem with that analysis, I think, is that he's already lost those people. Mm. Okay, and I think that that one of the weird processes has been happening. He's been taking votes from Democrats. He's been mm. getting all the racist Democrats, mm. all the populist, mm. crazo people mm. who've just been historically Democratic, mm. and he's been pulling all those. And I don't know if he can go to that well again mm. because he did get more of them in that last election. Okay, but of course Biden got even more. And 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 and, and there seems to be a. a an affinity with, in particular, black men and Hispanic men for yeah. Trump as well. A little bit, he's, yeah. He's been no, you can, you can kind of see that. Yeah. Um, but still, uh, you know, in both those, you are mm. talking about a Democratic mm. advantage. Mm. Um, the um, the electorate is going to be a lot younger. Yeah. And, you know, hugely younger next time, particularly in swing states like uh, like um, Arizona and Georgia. Mm. And, um, you, you know, what you're seeing in Wisconsin and Michigan, they both had, it's it seems that like they're shifting significantly blueward. Mm. Um and so I just don't know if, if I were in their room, you know, the, all these people, they sit around all day and go, what's our route to 270 mm-hmm. votes? And mm-hmm. it's unclear. Can I give you my election? Oh, yeah, go. Go for okay, it. Okay, yeah. speaking of which. Yeah. Okay, just to remind people, yeah. the American election is based on the Electoral College. Each state has a specific number of electoral votes yes. based on the number of senators plus the number of um, representatives. Yes. Okay? Um, so it's a very unfair system mm-hmm. because a very small state like North Dakota, even though it only has one... House of Representative, it still has um, two senators, so it gets three electoral votes, whereas California, which probably has 30 times as many people, Mm. only has 10 times as many as as electors, but still. So you got to get 270, Yeah. okay? And um, Biden won handily the last election. Mm -hmm. However, he won on these basically four swing states, and they were actually pretty small margins in all of them together, the same way Trump won four years before. Um, So... It is. There's all sorts of things in history. Um, you know, people come up with these these crazy Rube Goldberg things where you might end up in electoral college tie because it's possible to get two, um, what two six nine and two sixty nine. Yes. Okay. Which is crazy, um, but it's all kind of a pipe dream. But it's you know it's very fanciful. It's kind of weird. Often comes down to New Hampshire and things like this. But but actually there are four swing states right now. Mm. Okay. And there are Wisconsin, Michigan, Arizona, and Georgia. Yep. And the way the vote went last time. I'll just say this, that if Trump wins Arizona and Wisconsin, 10 electoral votes each, and then wins either Michigan or Georgia, 16 electoral votes, that's an electoral college tie, 269, 269. And the thing is, it's really not that far-fetched. There's four swing states, and it's not that unusual. Um, It's entirely possible for both Arizona and Georgia to get back into his column. They're both very close. Yeah. And then maybe he pulls out a win in Wisconsin. Yeah. Okay. So it needs to be that. He needs to be two of the 10 states and one of the 16 states. And there could be a tie, which will be insane. And to remind you what happens if there's a tie, it goes then to a vote in the House, but not the actual Congress. It's the, it's each state gets one congressional vote. I believe at this point in time, Republicans would win that. So, yeah, I, I'd have so, to go back and so, check. So it'd be a Trump victory. If but it would be yeah. so fundamentally unfair <laughs> because specifically each state, but of course, all the red states are the least populous states with one or two exceptions. Okay, mm-hmm. the, the most um, unpopulated American states, like the top 20, I think 16 are red states. Mm-hmm. So each of those would get one vote. They'd eat, you know, so South Dakota, Oklahoma, North Dakota, yeah. all those ridiculous states with nobody in Montana, mm-hmm. Wyoming mm-hmm. would all have as many votes as California, New York. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. So um, that's what would happen. In theory, you could almost have a tie. But of course, each House delegation has to vote. Yes. So I don't know if you remember the show Veep. Do you watch Veep? Uh, there was I actually a big thing in Veep where it all came down to one state, yeah. and then you had this number of people, and then one of them died and got yeah. replaced by someone. Yeah. So the whole um, shebang could come down to maybe one person, one state. Yeah. So, um, and you could have someone in jail at the same time. So it could yeah. be really fun. Yeah. Well, no, no, that is a certainly. It's good to put on the record right now. If that pans out, that will be amazing. Um, just to finish off, why I think that won't be happening now, because I think Biden has the whip handle. 
Um, you mentioned the economy. I've been looking a lot into it. Um, the Biden has terrible economic approval ratings. They're in the mid-30s at the moment. But the fact is that that's understandable. Inflation, inflation has only just been dropped down to normal levels in the last, last month or two. Um, it looks like inflation isn't going to be going up again anytime soon, but it might. But it looks like it won't. Real incomes have only started, just started rising again in the last three months. Given 12 more months of like assuming the economy continues as it is at the moment, then people will start to notice and it will help Joe Biden's approval, right? Because, because yeah, they're basically just coming off a crisis now, or a crisis, a bad times, because inflation really stuffs people around. Um, give him 12 months of, no, of low inflation and that will help his numbers. Traditionally, this time of, of the cycle is always when the president is the, has the worst approval. They only go up from here, usually. So right now, 43-43, if you look at history, it's Biden's low point, and then he'll start going up. That's traditionally. Obviously, as I said, things can change. It just takes one health incident. <laughs> but, um, uh, donations. There are a bunch of articles in the last week that Democrat donations are down this year. Act Blue has small dollar donations at the federal level totaling $312 million in the first half of 2023, which is $30 million less than it was in 2019. 32% fewer donors for, for Act Blue, small donors, in the second quarter. But, number one, they're raising more money than Republicans are. That's the first thing. Secondly, there's no competitive primary this year. There was in 2019. You raise more money when there's a competitive primary. I actually think those numbers are really good, like for the Democrats I'm talking about. So I think donations aren't going to be a problem for them, at least so far. Every time there's a trial, uh, anything to do with trials, they raise more money as well. So they're going to they're going to be swimming in money, I suspect. Um, uh, also, while Biden and Trump, at least according to New York Times, are forty three forty three, um, that leaves fourteen percent undecideds. According to Nate Cohen, those fourteen percent are disproportionately young, disproportionately black, disproportionately democratic, and disproportionately supported supporting Joe Biden in twenty twenty. Now, if they vote exactly how they voted. In 2020, Joe Biden would win by two points, which isn't much. That's not like a crushing victory. So, yeah, he's not going to be pulling out the champagne bottles from that news. But it's an advantage. That's my point. All these things are advantages. That's not me saying Joe Biden's going to win. That's me saying if I'm taking a bet at this point in time, I would be betting Joe Biden because I'd say it's like a yeah, a 55-45 or a 60-40 bet Joe Biden's way at this point in time. Yeah, but also I think we have to bake in that we've seen this before. I mean, Trump lost by what I forget what it was, four million votes. Yeah. Um, originally. He lost yeah. by seven million votes the second time. Yeah. Nothing has gone to make him people saying, Oh no, we really no, don't have I know, back. but an election's about the incumbent. No, it no, but it's true. Yeah. But still like yeah. it, it, he's it, it's a little bit different. He's not like Bill Clinton coming out of Arkansas no, to go up isn't. against a, <laughs> you know, an established person, right? That's true. And um he he's baked in and then again it comes down to those states and the demographic yeah. and and again, I'm not saying I'm not whistling past the graveyard or anything. I'm just yeah. saying that 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 the reality is like the demographics of Arizona and Georgia are both intellectually changing. Both states have both um democratic senators right Absolutely. now, which is yeah. unthinkable a few yeah. years ago. Um and um, and not only, and actually, you know, they actually have had Democratic senators, but they're extraordinarily conservative Democratic senators, yeah. like in Georgia. And now you have actual. And yeah. um, in Arizona, you got a crazy Republican Party. In in Georgia, you've got a popular re Republican governor. Governor. So, like, so they're different situations. So things could happen. Exactly. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing yeah. is for sure. But yeah. um, it is kind of. I mean, the dynamics. Um, and of course, they always say this. You know, like you know, Democrats are always wetting the bed. They're scared. Um, um, about things, and um, it, it, I assume like the money is going to be used in a very thing. Oh, and this is one thing I was going to say when we get back to the, the Dobbs decision. I I hear people in the Democratic Party talking, and they dismiss the myth. They say, "Oh, everyone says the Democrats don't know how to message," and blah 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 blah. But again, we were talking about this before the show. The I don't understand why the abortion amendment is on this November's ballot in Ohio. Yeah. Like, it just seems crazy to me. They just sit there and go, no, we're going to put it on the ballot next year mm. to help people bring out. I think there might be one in Arizona. There's some talk about getting one on in mm. Arizona, but you'd think that they would be very, very, the biggest cudgel they have is Dobbs, yeah. I think. Yeah. And um, 
And then the other thing I don't understand about the Democrats is why they don't campaign more. Like it, it, like the, the issue of gay rights has gotten all mixed up with the issue of trans rights. Yes. But one thing I don't understand is why they don't use the issue of gay rights, which is overwhelmingly popular. Yeah. And I just don't see why like every, I don't understand generally the words out of um, Biden's mouth should be the Trump deficit, the Trump deficit, the Trump deficit, mm -hmm. Dobbs, 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 Dobbs. They're anti-abortion. They're stopping mm -hmm. you from having abortions. Gay rights, they're persecuting gay people. They hate gay people. They think gay people are animals. They think they're disgusting. They think they're going to hell. I don't understand why he doesn't use that about Russia. Every time he talks about Russia to, you know, there's young people. If you say Vladimir Putin is systematically persecuting homosexuals in Russia, mm. That completely is a polarizing issue for younger people. And I just think the Democrats are just sort of afraid to use those cudgels that the Republicans for years have used the other way. And um, I think those are the things that I think would help turn think, the election as well. I think that's a good point. And I think that the, in particular, using the gay rights cudgel in the trans space, I think is a good way yeah, of Yeah, just it. dodge the trans issue. Because they have done it with abortion. With abortion, they talk about contraception a lot. Yeah, like which is which is doing basically what you're talking about. Like, yeah, you know, like the I mean, they're they're winning the abortion debate right now anyway. But that aside, they're not even like they they often talk about contraception, which it's like a ninety nine to one kind of issue. Like where they really slam them on that one. So the uh, so I mean that is basically what you're talking about. So yeah. Yeah, I mean I think it's a fair point. And so I, and I was thinking like in um, when you look at the the polling on the abortion issue in mm. Ohio, you totally would want that to completely disrupt the governor's election mm. and the Senate election next year in that same mm. state. Now, those people are very smart in the Democrat Party and maybe they, the Democratic Party, maybe they have some special plan, mm. but it just kind of feels to me that why don't you just wait a year and, and um, bring that bring that shiv well, out of your back pocket. Maybe they care about the abortion and not winning elections. <laughs> maybe yeah. that's the, way, the yeah. reason they had the abortion but, amendment but putting up putting ohio on the map yeah. would be another oh, game I know. changer i know i know you're, you're right from a from a from a cynical political machinations kind of a machiavellian point of view you're right it's a complete own goal like they they missed an opportunity yeah. there yeah. i think but they just, do that yeah. a lot yeah. yeah anyway uh the only other thing i'd say is special elections t reading from special elections 538 did an analysis on this there have been 38 special elections held so far this year. Democrats have outperformed the pars and lean of those races by an average of 10%. Between the 28 midterms and the 2020 elections, they outperformed by 4%, and Biden ended up winning by four and a half points. Uh, that's probably abortion-related, I imagine. Mm -hmm. um, and But it's an advantage. So anyway, so, so once again, I just want to emphasize, don't think I'm saying Biden's going to win. That's me saying... Oh, me neither. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 that's me saying that if you... And to, and to, to the extent that we can tea, read, tea leaf read at this point in time, Biden has a bunch of advantages, advantages that can easily be blown. But, but those advantages exist at this point in time. So that's all I would say about that. Do you have anything else to say about the election before we go on? Nope. Okay. I want to talk about the, I've got a big topic and you've got a big topic. Okay, I want, what's yours? I, I want to talk about the UAP hearing, the UFOs. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. I've been promising to talk about this for a while. We've had questions on, on YouTube from people asking us to talk about it. Um, um, finally, I, and I just, I, I got a feeling that you'd have a lot to say about this. So I want to do this with you, with you. First of all, before we even start, we should declare our priors because a lot of this, when, when we talk, when you talk about UFOs, like I think you do need to declare what your bias is like in this kind of stuff. Do you want me to go first or do you sure, want me to go first? Sure, yeah. Okay, I'll go first. I'll tell you what my, what my personal bias is about UFOs before I go through the hearing. Okay, I think the universe is big, okay? There's about 10 trillion trillion planets out there. Uh, with, uh, well, there are 10 trillion trillion planets with a star. There's even more planets without a star, but let's, I think you need a star for life. So 10 trillion trillion planets with a star. So it seems to me it's almost certain that there's other life somewhere in the universe, right? Just from sheer numbers, sheer way of numbers. I think it's almost certain as well that, that some of that life is intelligent somewhere in the universe, right? That doesn't mean they can travel to us though, right? Now, who said it's even possible to travel that far? We have this assumption that as technology increases, if, you, if man somehow continued on for another million years, we'd have this amazing technology. You go in a wormhole and you shoot to the other side. Yeah. Who said any of that is possible? Like maybe it's just too far away. Maybe it's just like the universe is literally 94 billion light years in diameter and it's expanding. Okay, who said that you can travel like like they, those those like if there's life, it might be a hundred million light years away. It might be twenty billion light years away. Who said it's even possible to 
to travel that far. Right. And, and just by definition, anything mm-hmm. that was more than, say, 60 mm-hmm. light years away would be impossible to get to for humans because you stick a 20-year-old astronaut. Well, unless we, unless we, our technology becomes immortal, like we become right. immortal right. through technology. Or we become robots, which is a whole different thing. Right? <laughs> like the, um, uh, I've, I've long been of the view that when people talk about this, this is a completely unrelated thing, but I've long been of the view when people talk about, oh, are the, are the robots going to kill us? In a hundred years time or two hundred years time, or three that, years time, yeah, yeah, I always say that's the wrong question. That's the wrong question because because in two hundred years time, it's not going to be the robots versus people. It'll be the people who are half robots versus the people who are not robots. Like or because because right. as soon as we have the technology to to implant chips in our brains and stuff, some rich guy is going to do it. Right, and as soon as you have the, the the technology to make yourself immune to disease, some rich guy is going to do it. As soon as you can make yourself super strong with some kind of uh, some kind of skeletal structure, some rich guy is going to do it. Right, and then before long, you'll have a situation where you have classes. You have a, you have a rich class who are augmented human beings, and you have a poor class who are not. And those and that's going to give them an even greater advantage, and that will continue on. So if that's my prediction. That long after we're dead, there's going to be people who who to us today would, would seem like they were half robotic, uh, like android type people, but that, but that would just be augmented human beings. Anyway, that doesn't matter. But my point is, you might be able to live for a billion years, maybe with extra technology, but it's just, it might just be impossible to travel that far. Like, you know, because if it's a billion light years away, who's traveling at the speed of light? That might not be possible, right? Like, the, the, uh, you, might, you might not even be able to get within a thousandth of the speed of light, right? The, like technologically speaking, which means then they're ninety four thousand billion <laughs> years away. You know, right. so so that's the first thing we don't know that the technology even exists for anyone, no matter high tech, to to travel. Let's say it is. How would they find us? They need to send a signal, right? Presumably, they don't know where we are. They have to send a signal out everywhere, try and get life, right? That's a pretty big signal. That takes a lot of technology. Sure, let's say they have that technology. It takes time for that signal to travel. It's not trying traveling fast in the speed of light. And, and it, it might take a million years if they're a million light years away to get to us and then get back. That's two million years for that signal to go back. What's it, what's it, it measuring? Is it measuring life? Is it measuring like electromagnetic waves or something like that? Because we didn't create electromagnetic waves until 200 years ago. So if someone needs electromagnetic waves to, to notice us, then they're not going to know about us for millions of years when we are long dead. Right? So that, that's another thing. So, so how they're going to find us is a real issue. Let's say they do find us. Let's say they have that technology and, there's, and, and they, can, they can measure amoebas. Let's say they can tell amoebas. And so they measure them, they measure them hundreds of millions of years ago and, and, then they've, and then they get the signal and then they're ready to go. Okay, how are they going to get there? All right, like they've got to physically travel. How much time is it going to take to get there, right? Okay, so that's another issue as well because once again, they're not traveling at the speed of light. Well, unlikely, right? So, so that takes a long time. So anyway, the odds are if they detected anything, it would have been amoebas or fish or something a few hundred million years ago. Uh, they get here, they have all this technology. It takes forever. The first thing they do when they get here is crash. No, if they have that technology, they're probably not crashing, right? They're probably, they probably know exactly what they're doing and they're probably not getting discovered by, by Hicks, right, in, in, in rural America. Um, and then, and then if, if one gets here, given that they're thousands of light years away, if not millions of light years away, another one isn't coming in a month's time. The next one will be hundreds of years' time or thousands of years' time. So they're not coming constantly all the time. So, so my prior is that I think it's almost certain that aliens exist somewhere that they probably have not come to the earth. And if they have come to the earth, they've come once. That is my, that is, that is my, so I, I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying that my personal belief is I'd, I would love it to happen. I think it's incredibly unlikely from a, from a, from a, just a probabilistic, probabilistic point of view. That's my prize. What's your prize? Um, that's so funny. I kind of come to this interesting conclusion in a completely different way, in a personal yeah. way, because yeah, yeah. I grew up in Arizona, yeah. which is the quintessential American Sunbelt state. Yeah. Okay. All the people, refugees from what they called the ref, Rust Belt. Mm-hmm. So both my, one came from New Hampshire, mm-hmm. one came from Detroit. They didn't like cold. They didn't like cities. Mm-hmm. 
didn't like black people. Yeah. They just wanted to come to, you know, this desert place where your land was cheap and blah, blah, blah. And so my mother was a quintessential American housewife. And like a lot of suburban housewives, she was really interested in UFOs. <laughs> sure. Okay. This yeah. is back in the 70s yeah. and the 80s. And it was so there was a there was a book called The Chariots of the Gods. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that was a big thing in Australia, mm-hmm. but it was about how there's all these indications on Amer- on on the earth about, you know, when gods were here, there would be crop circles in Peru and mysterious formations and Atlant. <laughs> remember when Atlantis was the secret thing <laughs> sure. under the ocean? And the thing is about my mom and uh, her friends is they were very um, Catholic in their interests, small C Catholic. Sure. So they were very, very, very interested in UFOs. They were also interested in palmistry, yeah. you know, where you <laughs> look at the high end lines of your hand, stuff like this. Um, There's a guy named Edgar Casey mm-hmm. who did a lot of things, what they called mental healing and being psychic and stuff like mm-hmm. this. And that, and there was a whole other slate of kind of paranormal thing, hypnotism, all this stuff. And my mom actually had this circle of friends. They had meetings at my parents' suburban house on Friday nights, just literally for decades. All these other ladies would come over and there'd be a special guest and they'd talk about healing or UFO. There was Area 51, mm-hmm. right, which is in New Mexico and Sedona had some sort of weird stuff going on. And so they're always taking trips to see all these things. So um, I have sort of a personal <laughs> thing about this. And what I think about in the decades since is that when you think about the proliferation of cameras and technology and all the filming and everything in the last 20 years, everything mm-hmm. that's been going on, the idea that on all that time, <laughs> there'd actually be no actually uncontrovertible mm-hmm. you know, evidence of something like this is... Um, is pretty silly. So um, I don't think any of that's interesting at all. And um, it's it's just such a ridiculous thing. For I mean, you, the way you put it was very elegantly and stuff like this. Mm-hmm. But I do agree with you. And people can look up this thing called Fermi's Paradox, right? Which you probably heard of. This famous physicist Enrico Fermi at one point said, well, look at why aren't there people? When, when you start doing the math, mm-hmm. the hundreds of billions of stars, perhaps trillions, mm-hmm. um, just in the Milky Way, I think there's 100 billion or something like this. Mm-hmm. And so, so say if only one in 100 have... Hab- habitable planet that's mm. still a billion mm. and given the rate of technology and change here on earth you know why haven't they mm. so the question is why haven't we seen anyone for a lot of the reasons that you said um and particularly when when the earth is a relatively new planet you know you think so um but for all the reasons you said it's pretty unlikely stuff like that um this is completely fanciful but for some reason i always think of this that um when we talk about these um analysis of whether there's extra dimensions we don't know about you know mm. all that's going to be hundreds of years in in um, in the future before we have the energy to really understand this as I understand it. But I read this really interesting thing once that um, just imagine if we lived in a comic strip, okay? We were Peanuts or something like this, mm-hmm. Linus and Lucy or, or even Doonesbury, right? Mm-hmm. Two guys talking like this. Yeah. We live in a two-dimensional world, yeah. okay? So say there's people living in a three-dimensional world and we don't know it. And we're sitting here talking, they throw a ball between us. Mm-hmm. Okay, so what would we see? We wouldn't see a ball because we're two-dimensional. Yeah. And what we'd see is a little dot that would grow to the size of a ball and then shrink back into nothing. We wouldn't know what it was. Yes. And so I do kind of think that if there is travel that involves other dimensions, yep. there might be weird stuff like this where you, there would be things happening that we couldn't quite understand because we just didn't have the understanding of that extra dimension. Mm. But then again, it comes down to thinking like, why don't more people, like if we see things like that over the New York City skyline or something, then you could say, oh, wow, that might have been... Mm. But there actually never is anything like that. It's always blurry and whatever. Mm. Now, the one thing I'll say is that we're talking about this because there was a hearing before the House. Yep. Um, I forget which committee it is, um, which is sort of like having a hearing uh, you know, be- before a Twin Peaks cast party. Okay, so this is a really <laughs> ragtag bunch of yep. idiots. Yep. And then, now the only interesting thing about it is they had an army guy there, or a yeah. military oh, guy. Oh, I'm going to talk about it. Don't worry. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, then why don't, yeah, why yeah, don't you Yeah, let's go into it. Okay, let's go here. I just want to do it, just set the scene. Yeah. Because, yeah, because I, I think people... When you talk about these things, people people want to know what your bias is, right? So I just wanted to clear my bias. Okay. There were three witnesses in the committee that had a hearing about UAPs. Two of them were guys who had witnessed UAPs. They, one was a Navy pilot who saw the famous Tic Tac UFO in 2004, which there is footage of, uh, which you, know, you may or may not be able to explain. Ryan Graves was another, another Navy pilot who in 2014 saw a dark gray or black, black cubes inside of a clear sphere where the apex or tips of the cubes were touching the inside of that sphere. I should say that description is quite similar to what you hear a fair bit these days when people say they've, they've seen a UFO. They just described what they saw. There wasn't too much interesting about what they had to say. We've, we've heard that kind of thing a number of times. Um, they're, they're not kooks. They, you know, they're just pilots, yeah, whatever. 
But the main guy was David Grush. Let's talk about him. He's a 36-year-old Afghanistan vet, former intelligence officer with the Air Force and the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Importantly, he served as the National Reconnaissance Officer's representative to the Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Task Force from 2019 to 2021. From late 2021 to, to 2022, he was the July 2022, he was the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency's co-lead for UAP analysis and its representatives, it was his representative to the UAP task force. He resigned and became a whistleblower after July 2022. Okay, so he is ex- he's exactly the person you would want to talk about this stuff, right? He, he actually has extremely recent knowledge. He was in all the places where you would be if, you, if, if something existed. You would know about it. He would know about it. He, was, he had access to all the info that you would want to talk to someone. To, yeah, go for and it. just one quick thing. Yeah. It's really important to note. He was testifying under oath. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Just absolutely. I'm not sneering. I'm not no, saying no. that facetiously. No, no, no. He was it's a important. serious guy yeah. from the military testifying under oath. Absolutely. Absolutely. Also, he's retired, so he can speak slightly more freely than he otherwise could. Um, so you just couldn't get a more ideal witness for the for the purposes of this hearing, right? He also was the one with all the big claims. So let's talk about his claims. Um. Unlike the other two, he openly admits he's never seen, personally with his own eyes, a UAP or or the uh, uh, an alien of any kind. That's what he said. I've not seen that. He's interviewed many people though, who say they have seen it. Right, that was kind of his job, talking to people. Right. Okay. So what did he say? He said that there were elements of the U.S. government that have secretly and illegally overseen a decades-long project to try to retrieve UFOs and then reverse engineer the technology that they find. He said that, that, that's basically what they're trying to do. They're trying to find them and then steal the technology and reverse engineer it, essentially. He seems particularly upset, he, he mentioned this many times, about the fact that they are a law unto themselves and have no proper supervision whatsoever. They have no supervision in the army. They have no supervision from Congress. Like they're just doing their own thing, essentially. Uh, I'll quote the Senate Intelligence Vice Chair Marco Rubio on this allegation. Either what Grush is saying is partially true or entirely true, or we have some really smart, educated people with high clearances and very important positions in our government who are crazy and are leading us on a goose chase. If he's correct, there are a group of people who believe that they possess something that they don't need to share with anybody, including elected officials, who they view as temporary employees of the government. Uh, Rubio likened that to an internal military complex that's their own government and is accountable to no one, which ultimately would be a huge problem, even if it's partially true. I agree with him. That would be a huge problem. That would be a huge problem. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, And it's a problem even if they've found nothing. That's still a problem. If you have people who are entirely unaccountable, just doing their own thing, that is a problem, right? Regardless of whether they've found UAPs or not. Uh, Grush then says that the US government has found UFOs. He said UFO craft, and they're in their possession right now. He was very explicit about that. They have decided that these vehicles are of non-human origin. They've tried to reverse engineer some of the technology already. He didn't say whether they were successful or not. He said his colleagues had been hurt by both UFOs and by people trying to stop them talking about UFOs. He says he knows exactly where the UFOs are kept. He said that the UFOs have provided biologics of non-human origin. I don't know what that means. Does that mean fingerprints? Does that mean little aliens? Does that mean... I I mean, I took biologics to mean something alive. Yeah, well... Maybe, maybe yeah. not. Maybe it's evidence of, maybe, like I said, yeah. it could be a fingerprint, could be a whatever. I, I don't know. I don't know what, he didn't specify what that means. He says he knows people personally have been harmed in efforts to cover up uh, or conceal extraterrestrial technology. He implies that they were murdered, but he didn't say it. Okay, so that's what he, that's what he said. Now, now, the first thing that, that we, we say in, in that, that you would say in response to that is, well, he hasn't seen anything himself. Even if he's an extremely serious person, maybe he talked to fruitcakes. Maybe. This is what he says. Quote, there's certain things that I have firsthand access to that I can't publicly discuss at this time. However, myself and other colleagues interviewed 40 individuals, both current and former, highly distinguished intelligence and military personnel that were specifically on the programs. 
and those who are willing are directed to the intelligence community inspector general. So the inspector general is able to interview these people that do have first-hand information. Now, that's important. That inspector general bit is important because he isn't talking to someone. Well, first of all, this point about the, about the 40 people he talked to, he's not talking to someone unless they're really qualified, right? They don't come on his radar if they're just some farmer, right? They come on his radar because they have top security clearance. They, you don't get them out of a cereal box. They're hard to get, okay? So one of them could be a fruitcake. Two of them could be a fruitcake. 40? Unlikely that they are fruitcakes, yeah. right? Also, when you, res- when you refer people to inspector generals, you're not fooling around anymore, okay? Inspector generals can verify things. They can put you under oath, right? They, yeah, like, so, so you're not making shit up when you're talking to inspector generals. Especially what he said, he said that the people with first-hand knowledge, he referred to them to, to provide pro- to protect the disclosure to the inspector general. He said that under oath, like you said. They can, Rubio can find that out. That stuff's public information. Who have you referred to the inspector general? So if he's lying about that, he can go to jail. So I don't think he's lying about that. I think he's telling the truth that he referred these people to the inspector general. Um, so what did the inspector general say? The inspector general is, is as serious as you get with this kind of stuff, right? The inspector general for intelligence. What did he say? He deemed Grush's allegations that UFO-related information was inappropriately concealed from Congress as, quote, credible and urgent. That's what the Inspector General said, the current Inspector General. Can we trust him? Well, he's certainly worked in the right places to know what's going on. By his own admission, he's seen, he hasn't seen anything. He's just passing what he's been told. He's also, I should say, at times embraced disproven hoaxes. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a theory out there that Mussolini recovered a partially intact UFO in 1933. That's been proven to be false. He recycled that at one point in time. So he is not beyond being wrong, I should say. And he might be susceptible to belief, right? The, uh, uh, even if he's not a fruitcake, he might be a little bit gullible at times. Um, but the Inspector General backing him up, I find that very compelling. Uh, his lawyer is Charles McCullough, who's the intelligence community's first Inspector General as well. Uh, he's a real heavy hitter, this guy. He wouldn't be hanging around this guy if he was just talking shit. All right, so that, that I feel like, I feel the fact that he's been backed by Charles McCulloch is also some kind of, uh, it helps his credibility somewhat. Grush is not the only one saying this stuff either. Uh, Jonathan Gray is an intelligence officer specialized in UAP analysis at the National Air and Space Intelligence Center. He says, quote, the non-human intelligence phenomenon is real. We are not alone. Retrievals of this kind are not limited to the United States. There's a global phenomenon, and yet a global solution continues to elude us. That's an important point, because another problem I've always had is that it's all, all America, as if they just land in America. Well, he says they're not just landing in America. Uh, Carl, Nell, Carl Nell was an army colonel who worked with Grush on the UAP task force. He said, his assertion concerning the existence of a terrestrial arms race occurring sub rosa over the past 80 years focused on reverse engineering technologies of unknown origin is fundamentally correct, as is the indisputable realization that at least some of these technologies of unknown origin derive from non-human intelligence. So, from my point of view, the bottom line is we can't know. He is very vague in his testimony about what he said. It, like he's, he has to be vague. It's classified. He kept on saying, <clears throat> I can't say more. It's classified. But he was prepared to say off the record what the classified stuff was, which I believe. He apparently has said it to the Inspector General, who can throw him in jail for perjury. So, um, so I think that's fair enough. They didn't say much of detail in, in Congress. I don't trust the committee much. They're a bit of, you mentioned before that, 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 were, that were goofs. Tim Burchett, who's one of the key people on this committee, said afterwards, I believe aliens exist. I knew that before I came in here. I don't want to oversimplify it, but how are you going to fly a spaceship? You've got to have somebody in it. That seems to be pretty simple. Like robots? It's not hard. Yeah. We no. send robots into space. No, that, guy, <laughs> no, that guy is such an idiot. I mean, he's just like such a bozo because yeah. I flagged another thing he said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Get yeah. this, okay? Yeah. This is a United States congressman. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, yeah. The UFO is emerging as a major topic of global importance he said after the hearing i met a fellow who came in here 
all the way from Denmark to be here for this meeting. So this is huge. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. okay, so I can I say two things about this? One, again, I want to give all respect to the guy, Jump testified in. under yeah. oath and stuff like this. But again, I've lived in America my whole life. Yeah. I've just heard this yeah. decade after decade after decade. And when you really read what that guy said, it was like the guy who cuts my hair's brother knows Beyonce's dog sitters on the down low boyfriend. And yeah. he said... Yeah. blank okay so it's just one of those things you go oh wow he testified what did he say oh well there's this guy who there's this i heard this so all that um the other thing when people asked him about um you know have people been hurt who've mm. come forward to this he goes oh i can't talk about that supposedly he's talked to the senate intelligence committee right yeah. behind closed doors yeah. which is you know i think marco rubio is probably on it so it's not the most august body group mm. of people in the world but it's he's a, a vice chair but it's a it's a serious operation, yes. right? So I don't understand what Marco Rubio is talking. Oh, what I don't know. I wonder what you know. He's supposedly had the hearing, right? Mm -hmm. He's heard what he mm -hmm. said behind mm -hmm. closed doors. So when Rubio comes out and talks about all those stuff, I go, "What are you talking about?" Mm -hmm. Like he could say, "Hey, we listen to this guy behind closed doors, and what he's saying is true." Mm -hmm. You know. So <laughs> the thing is, again, <laughs> Jimmy Carter, mm -hmm. Reagan, the first Bush, <laughs> Clinton, the second Bush, Obama. And then we had even Trump, right? You've had all the chiefs of staff. Mm. You've had all the defense secretaries. You've had the assistant. I mean, there's like, in each of those administrations, there's probably two or three dozen really serious people who are in the actual closed rooms, okay? And none of the, like, those are the people who would know. And you don't mm. think Bill Clinton says, hey, tell me, I want to find out about UFOs, mm. you, that George Bush didn't, that Clinton didn't, that Trump didn't? Trump absolutely did, I'm sure. That they that. all, and that's I'm the first sure, thing they said. I'm also sure, uh, unlike- He would have said uh, something. Uh, yeah, unlike Obama and Clinton and all the rest of them, I'm absolutely sure that if, if he found anything, he would have tweeted about it instantly before he left the, the classified room. He would, have, he would have tweeted about it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But none of these people, never, no New York Times thing has ever talked to any, you know, anyone who worked for Clinton or Obama or George Bush. None of those people saying, well, you know, I got to say, we finally had those bozos in the room and they did tell mm -hmm. us. And, and I understand the Defense Department is the largest, mm -hmm. you know, bureaucracy in the world, right? It is really complicated and there are people out with knives and, you know, doing stuff. But... You know, it is still, there is still civilian command of the military, and people can go and ask questions. You can go to this person, and go to the next person, and go to the next person. You can find these things out. It's really not that hard. And so I'm just, you know, hugely skeptical that over all these decades, like, here we are, mm -hmm. and all we got is a guy saying, well, I talked to this guy once, and he said, you know, mm -hmm. it's just kind of... Um, and so when I read those stories, it's funny because literally three people here in Australia have mentioned this to me. And so I was kind of, oh my God, I'm really missing something here. I really mm. have to dig down in this mm. issue. And then when, you know, you're just really waiting for someone to say, yeah, I saw it. It's like, oh, someone I know saw something. So mm. um, I'm I'm totally interested and totally hear about it. I think what you say that, why would they be crashing? You know, mm. why couldn't they just mm. land? It's yeah. like, it's completely crazy. And um, it doesn't, to me, it just doesn't even pass that first smell test thing, mm. like, there's just no one who said anything f substantive at all. Um, that said, it's the United States military, <laughs> which is a formidable operation, and God knows what really goes on. And I have to honestly say that I wouldn't all, if someone really said, well, actually, there has been this thing at by law, it's top secret and answerable to no one, and it's their job, and they've been given a hundred year thing to just go in and take people out, just like we see in the movies, and, and chloroform people and give people shots so they don't remember what they saw, you know? Maybe that's really happening, And but I would hope they're doing that. So mm -hmm. if that is true, I would hope they're doing it, and um, maybe that's why it is top secret. But I have to say, as a suburban boy who grew up amidst the great UFO scares of the 70s, 80s, and 90s, yeah. I um, am still waiting to see anything. And the other thing is, is that in response to all the sightings, mm. which is an entirely different issue from what this guy says, yeah. that, you know, one position is, oh, you know, it's a big world. There's 8 billion people on it. There's crazy stuff with me we don't understand. And there have been six really, really substantive mm. understand things saying, oh, there's some things we don't know yet. Mm. <laughs> and then jumping to, oh, it's extraterrestrial life visiting America. Mm. So I'm I'm just skeptical. Look, I, I, I am too. I, I didn't quite get to my bottom line, but essentially... Essentially, what I think is, I think, I mean, I haven't changed. This is why I declared my bias at the beginning. My bias is that it ain't aliens, yeah. right? But the, um, 
but I think that the, and I haven't changed that bias. I haven't changed that view, but I do think that he, that this testimony at least gives reason for serious investigation. And that's it. Like he says, I know where they are. Yeah. I've told the Inspector General. Okay, I want to hear what the Inspector General has to say when they, when they go looking. Right. And also, like, oh, I just but go also, look. It, it also, it's just not that hard. Like, mm. like you know, everyone's acting like, oh my God, okay, we'll yeah. have to check back in 2028. It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like, this isn't something yeah, yeah. they could have done this three days ago. Yeah. You know, they, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. and so, totally. um, and, but this guy was not helped mm. by going before this committee. That's the other thing that mm. there, to me, there's a real question is why he's even there because obviously the people who are running it are complete bozos. Mm. Um, and so that's another thing that makes you feel a little weird about it. But, mm. um. So we'll see. That's and, all I yeah, have to say. Sure. That. Anyway, I, 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 all I would say is that I feel like, I think it's, if, I'm, if I'm assessing probabilities, I would say that the sheer number of people with high clearances saying that there is something, there's some department somewhere with something, suggests to me that there is something in some department. I don't think it's aliens. But I think, I think it's worth investigating what that thing is. Does, is there some kind of department that doesn't have oversight? That's worth investigating. Like like Rubio said, I think that the I think that the that there is a very real chance that there is something somewhere that isn't explainable. That's fine. That doesn't mean it's aliens. Yeah. Like the uh, and I, I think that I would like to see people look into that, and I'm sure they are. I'm sure they are. <laughs> but, uh, and I would like the Inspector General to to release a public, not unclassified report about this kind of stuff. Um, like to following up on this kind of stuff. Yeah. It's kind of like the Kennedy assassination yeah. that that over the decades they're just you, it's it's kind of like um, Nabokov's pale fire book that you mm. can you can interpret the book and then you can mm. peel that layer down and then go to the next layer and then go mm. peel that down and, then, and that it was designed to almost not an not an infinite thing but layer after layer that changes the meaning and it's kind of like UFOs Kennedy assassinations and there's so many issues in a, in in our cultural and social lives that mm. of course there's going to be one or two that are just a little hard to figure out mm. and and that over the years they get delved into and delved into totally. and um and just in my decades i would you know just every 10 years you'd read the latest book the definitive report on the kennedy assassination yeah, so sure. just, you know, well you know that's how i feel but the this. difference in this and the kennedy assassination is that if if there is anything that's of interest in some kind of storage somewhere it just takes a photo it, it, there's, there's no photo of of the the third thing on me yeah yeah like yeah, yeah like the, the, it, that's unprovable the kennedy thing but this is provable yeah. this is very provable yeah. they're talking about physical objects so like at some point in time like i think i think it's well worth having a number of investigations into this kind of stuff but at some point in time after a number of these investigations if they don't dig up anything you're gonna go well there's nothing because yeah. one photo would, <laughs> would, would 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 prove it one or another and i think the trump thing is really a powerful point. I Seriously. really do. There's no way Trump hasn't didn't try and find out, and there's no way Trump wouldn't have told us if, if he knew. Yeah. So it's um, and nobody yeah. told it. Like Clinton never told anyone who told someone. Mm -hmm. Someone on Hillary Clinton's staff never told anyone. You know, someone on Al Gore's staff never told yeah. any. You know, no one on Cheney's staff told. It's just no one on Dan Quayle's staff. You know, just the idea that there'd be these you know, hundred people at the running the United States government over the past 50, 60 years, mm. everyone in this has been, and again, the reason I brought all that stuff about my parents is that this is part of the American yeah. thing, you know, this UFO thing. So mm. it's not like, Oh, all of a sudden we're interested in UFOs. This is mm. something that is permeate, not permeated, but been a, a steady tattoo in American life for the past 60 years. Mm. And, I, you just have never heard, like, yeah. no one who ever said, like, oh, yeah, I was on Al Gore's staff. We had a series of meetings. Mm. There's this thing. No one can talk about it. Mm. I'd, I'd, I'd believe that from yeah. Al Gore's chief of staff. Yeah. You know, I believe from, you know, who, Bill Crystal, right? He was Dan Quayle's chief of staff. Mm. Him saying, you know what? We actually had some meetings. We can't talk about it. It's not a frivolous issue. Mm. I would believe that. Mm. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Let's find out. Now you have a topic, Actors Strike. Oh yeah. Do you want to talk about this yes, really quickly? I, do. I, do. I just find this yeah. super interesting yeah. and I have one observation or, or yeah, um, yeah. perspective just, on just it go, worth doing. So everyone knows that there's a strike going on in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Three or four months ago, the writers went on strike. Mm -hmm. um, then I guess last month, six weeks ago, um, that no, first of all, the directors took a pass. Mm -hmm. They could have supported the writers and didn't. That's the DGA. Mm -hmm. And then about a month, six weeks ago, the actors said, we're going to go on strike too. Okay, so um, 
I don't know if you watched the Oscars, but about 10, 15 years ago, Steve Martin came out and he said, he said, this is at the beginning of the Academy Awards, right? Mm -hmm. Steve Martin, he says, writers, directors, actors, if we're all stuck in here and have to eat each other for food, that's the order <laughs> in which we eat people. <laughs> okay? So the point being, the writers are very low on the, po- on yes. the totem pole. Yes. And nobody really cares about them. Okay? But um, the writers have about, I'm going to kind of get this wrong, but that it's, it's all very complicated. There's actually two writers guilds, but there's basically 10,000 people involved in them, okay? Mm-hmm. And some number of that, probably 1,000, 2,000, are gainfully employed and make money. The others are not. They mm-hmm. do other jobs, but they participate in some way, or they write scripts, or they have written a script or a pilot or something like that. Um, so it kind of doesn't matter. The writers kind of don't matter. It freezes things, and you get a lot of people like the late-night comics saying, hey, we're quitting in sympathy, or we're not going to be on the air. Um, it's not that big of a deal. When the actors join, that's, that's the end of the discussion. The actors you got, um, they, they, there's actually two actors guilds as well. There's the SAG and there's AFTRA, which is the radio people. I used to be a member of that. So that's huge now, 150,000 people. Okay, we're not talking 10,000, talking no. 150,000 people. Now, the actors, though, are kind of like the writers, where you have, what, 100 of them, 200, making millions of dollars a year, a couple thousand making pretty good livings, right? And then 100,000 people yeah. who aren't really actors, they're waiters. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. Or, or Uber drivers and stuff like mm-hmm. that. Um, the observation I wanted to make is that this is a profoundly asymmetrical um, issue. Everything about this is asymmetrical. It used to be with the union things like this, you're the Teamsters, which is the famously tough union in America. You unload things on the docks, right? Mm -hmm. And you got shipping companies versus the Teamsters. All the Teamsters are people who unload stuff off the docks. All the shipping companies run ships, okay? Kind of used to be in Hollywood. You had the studios, which are very complicated because you have studios that make movies and then you have TV studios that make all these different TV shows and sell them to different TV networks. So it's all kind of mixed up. But basically, there were these studios that made movies and TV shows, right? Mm -hmm. Some of them were owned by corporations. Now you have the, um, so when you talk about these two in unions, the reason I went into that is that they're kind of weird. They're kind of unbalanced because you don't have 150,000 actors who are all acting on the same level. Like with Teamsters, you just have this very disparate thing. Mm. So you can have the actors voting, for example. And if you or I were quote unquote members of the actor, but we really Uber drivers, right? Mm. And so the issue was we wanted to get paid more. We'd say, hell yeah. Mm. And they'd say, well, you have to go on strike. And it's like, well, we're not really employed as actors yeah. anyway. We're still going to be running over. So we can go on strike as long as you want. Yeah. Okay. So it's very unwieldy. Like you're not, um, the people who aren't making money are these very, very rich people who really can live with it. And there's people who are making a pretty good living who can do without it for a while, but at a certain point are going to start really feeling some serious pain, yeah. right? When you have $2 million houses in, you know, in West, mm-hmm. in West Hollywood. Um, but they're always going to get voted by the 120,000 mm-hmm. people who really can stand strike as long as you want. So it's very complicated yeah. on that level. So then on the other side, you don't have studios really anymore, or you do, but each studio is completely different from all the other studios. And then you have Netflix mm-hmm. and then you have Apple and then you have Amazon. Okay. So the asymmetricality on management side is completely crazy now. Okay. So you have one company, Disney, right? Which is a mega company. Disney recently bought 20th Century Fox. Disney, remember, does Disney movies. It does Pixar, does Marvel movies and Lucasfilm movies. Now it also owns the 20th Century Fox catalog. So it's a super studio, very dependent on this. On the other hand, as we all know, has theme parks, ABC, ESPN, kind of stuff like that. Warner Brothers is completely insane. It just got bought out by Discovery, which is a stupid company. So now they own Warner Brothers and CNN. They're completely in chaos. They have way too much debt. They completely screwed up the CNN Plus thing. They just had to fire the head of CNN. Everything's in chaos there. Paramount is trying to run the streaming service, which isn't doing very well. Mm -hmm. Okay, they're trying to get into the streaming thing. They're in chaos. Um, And then you have Netflix, which is a pure streaming kind of thing. But then you have Apple, which does streaming. But you know what? It's Apple. It's worth $3 trillion. And, you know, Apple could double, triple, you know, deck tuple its streaming business and it wouldn't even be noticed. Mm. It'd be like the the profits it makes from one freaking Apple store. Mm. And then you have Amazon, which is a mega company too, and just runs Mm. Prime Video as a loss leader for its Mm. Prime Video service. So 
the point being that it's insane and nobody understands how this is going to work. Mm-hmm. And and they tried to have start having meetings again last week and then that just blew up in a, uh, a big blow up of um, recriminations and stuff like that. The issues involved are very, very complicated and legal and technical. That, and one of them, which is the use of AI, nobody actually understands. Mm-hmm. And they keep making proposals and they get shot down. But in truth, nobody kind of understands. And one of the things the studio said is, hey, if you're an extra, you come in, we're going to film you, and then we can use your likeness and do anything we want for the rest of eternity. And then, so the actors were saying, well, that's probably not a good idea. <laughs> um, but also nobody even knows. And I think it's kind of a moot subject anyway, because they can just use AI to say, hey, create me a Tom Hanks-like character that's mm. affable and friendly and is very cute and kind of satiric, but not too mean mm. that, you know, women between the ages of 12 and 38 will love and men within the ages of 24 and 48 will love. And um, so I think that's kind of moot. Then there's this whole issue with writer's rooms, which is all very complicated because we don't, most people don't know this, but TV shows have like 10 or 15 people writing it. Different writers do different characters. I I wish they did. Yeah. (laughs) Yes, I know. It's very complicated. And then there's all this stuff that you have at at least eight or at least 10 or at least two, and it's all very complicated. Mm -hmm. And then then there's this whole issue with residuals because it used to be um, if you worked on some show like um, just some generic Beverly Hills 90210. Mm. You know, once you get to 100 episodes, it goes into syndication. And then basically, if you're a writer on that show, you're basically making one hundred and fifty or $200,000 for the rest of your life based on residuals, which is a nice thing. Really? Oh, yeah. No, I if you're did, on I, a, I didn't know you were making that kind of money. Oh, yeah. If, you, if, you, if you're on any one of the shows that goes into syndication, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're just, you're just going to get like thousands, a thousand, couple thousand dollars a week for the rest of your life. Yeah. Okay. Because they're just getting broadcast all around the world. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's just crazy. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know if I told you this, but I started getting checks for Bill Wyman one time of the Rolling Stones because he'd <laughs> been on some weird TV show. Yeah. And because I was a member of AFTRA, they, they mixed it up. And I started mm-hmm. getting checks for like $50 a week, <laughs> like twice a week, yeah. you know, oh, until I finally figured out what the issue was. Yeah. And that was just from being on one single show that was running on VA. H1. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. think about, say, Law and Order that's being broadcast in 30 countries around the world mm. almost all the time. Yeah. You know, even if you're only getting $50, $50 per, um, per episode or something like that, it really adds up over time. So, anyway, but the thing is, the streaming services don't operate that way. Mm. You just do a show for Netflix, Netflix has it, they keep it for the rest of their lives. Now, they pay more upfront. Mm. Okay. Um, but on the other hand, a lot of times it's going to people like Ryan Murphy, Shonda Rhimes, these super producers who have five or six or seven shows. They're dealing literally with nine-figure deals with these platforms. Um, and they don't want to release the viewership. And it always surprised me. People say, oh, that show I was on Netflix, it says it's the number one show watched in Australia. Mm. And I said, it's really not the number one show. <laughs> Netflix is just saying that for some yeah. crazy reason. Yeah. They're tr- it's not even clear why they even do it because yeah. what do they care if it's the number one show or not? They, yeah. they just want you to keep watching. Mm. So, um, and then of course, what benefits, say you take one of these standalone services like Paramount Plus, which is the Paramount streaming service. Um, what they want is stuff. They want to get your show and they're all crunching the numbers. Hey, when we ran Chaz's show, it bumped up our, our subscribers by 1.2% and the churn rate on that 1.2% was basically zero. So basically he improved our streaming numbers by 1.2% straight across the board. That's worth a lot of money to us. Mm. Other people might make it to 5%, but the churn means after a year, it goes back to 1%. It's all very complicated. They all understand those things. So their metrics are completely different from the old days. Yeah. All of which is to say, this is my one observation about it, is that it's so fascinating because because all the different parties all have completely different interests. It's just not the way it used to be. And... Um, that everyone's afraid of these new services. They're strange and new. Everyone's afraid of AI. That's strange and new. Everyone's afraid of the new um, payment things, which is strange and new. Um, and a lot of these places are all in crisis. I didn't even mention Disney, mm. which just had like five flops. Mm. Um, you know, um, the uh, Indiana Jones was a flop. The Flash was a flop. Um, then I forget what the um, the new Mission Impossible is, but that's a big flop. Mm. And um, they think they're going to be losing two or three hundred million dollars on Indiana Jones alone. The new Pixar movie isn't doing well, um, and it's very scary. And the entire movie industry, as opposed to the TV industry, which is largely streaming, is um, been dependent on all these superhero movies and franchises and reboots and toy things. And at a certain point, everyone's going to say, "You know, I'm so freaking sick of Marvel." Mm. 
And when that happens, <laughs> that point is twenty fourteen. For me? Could, no, yes. no, it's. But I mean, it, yes. I don't know if you know this, but the entire top twenty um, box office is all superhero movies, franchises, reboots, mm. sequels, yeah, all, all I, that stuff. I, I noticed. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. No, it's crazy. Yeah. There literally is no normal movie that, industry anymore. Well, that's that's what's so good about Oppenheimer. You just go. That's, yeah. That's, no, and that's Barbie like too. A movie that used to get made. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, but it's very. I mean, even that. That's a Nolan movie, and his movies have really been dropping in appeal as well. Mm. I mean, Interstellar didn't do that well. I loved Interstellar. It's a good movie. Yeah. Tenant. Um, Tenant <laughs> came out during the um, pandemic and caused mm. a whatever. But mm. but even the Nolan brand, mm. which is relatively independent, even though he's a franchise mm. unto himself, um, Oppenheimer um, took that took that a little bit back but that's all really great news but remember let's remember barbie is based on a toy it's not like it's yeah. a original movie yeah. um and um i really like margot robbie by the way mm-hmm. and i think i read something that they hadn't signed her up for a sequel which is really good for her because that means that they need her for a sequel but i also she produced that movie my understanding is if for example barbie won best picture she would get the statuette so um as the producer so she's a very impressive person but anyway the whole point of that this is it's going to be really fun. Couldn't, so what, I would say what's going to happen? I couldn't happen to a nicer group of people. <laughs> okay, which is really fun. And I just don't. It's just hard to figure out because net, even even the streaming services mm. all have different agendas, mm. and they're not the studios. All the studios are in financial crises differently of their yeah. own making, and they don't. They're not going to agree. I was going to say like like the actors have their have their group, but. The studios, if they're all individuals and all completely different, how are they? How, how can they negotiate? That's the thing. And then the one person who kind of felt like um, a major power broker, Bob Iger, mm. he recently left Disney. Disney had this corporate meltdown. They had to bring him back desperately and mm. oust his chosen successor. Yeah. He's been kind of saying really, really impolitic things. And so it's not like, you know, just think if you're, if you're Jeff Bezos, mm. like- like if you're in California and Hollywood and Bob Iger, right? Bob Iger is the name that stops conversation mm. because he was, you know, the head of Disney. He's the one who bought Pixar, mm. brought in Marvel, brought in Lucasfilm. Okay. Mm. He turned Disney from a powerhouse into a super powerhouse, right? Mm. Jeff Bezos, <laughs> Jeff Bezos doesn't care what Bob Iger thinks. Yeah. Okay. Tim Cook, he's going to say, who? <laughs> yes. Oh, Disney. Oh yeah. Mm. And, um, that though, and even even the people Reed Hastings running Netflix, it's like you know what, you know Disney, you know Disney's budget is is lent on uh, Netflix's shoulder. So mm-hmm. they there isn't that kind of group of the old studio people in the room who can you know come together and say okay let's just cough this up. So um, anyway, that's I, I have no predictions to make, but it's a very very difficult thing. Um, it could be that the stu- that the streaming services go oh what the hell we've been sending eight billion dollars a year on product. You know, our numbers say, look, it's going to cost another hundred million. Let's give the pathetic writers what they want. I feel like, I feel like, um, I mean, this is, you've raised so many issues. I know it's very but, complicated. No, I was going to say, but at the very least, the residuals one. This is something I've thought bef- a lot, a lot of before, a lot about before. I always thought to myself, like, you know, like, the, like the model has kind of been broken a little bit by these huge international conglomerates, like Netflix. It's everywhere. You know, it's not just, it's not like you know, the residuals as you say, works on, oh, it's gone to Australia now. Now it's gone to Czechoslovakia. Now and it's there's gone people to, sending out yeah, checks. Yeah, totally, yeah. yeah. Whereas Netflix is just one organization and all these ones, right? And I feel like that that you could establish, don't get too far from the mic there. <laughs> yeah. I feel like um, that, I mean, maybe this is just uh, uh, financially illiterate for me to say, but I've always thought there's a big gap there with, yeah, with a sort of a Spotify for TV kind of thing, or a Spotify for movies, right? The uh, in that, as someone who's a bit of a collector of music, TV, and and movies, and we should talk off air about that at some point in time. <laughs> but, um, um, I I get very frustrated by the fact that if even if I purchased every single streaming service, you just like they only have stuff for a short period of time and it disappears. Like, where am I going to get the Mary Tyler Moore show? Like, you go nowhere. Where am I going to get? To get Blossom, <laughs> yeah. Where am I going to get to get uh, yeah, NYPD Blue? You know, like just like and th- and that th- and there are all kinds of stuff that you'd love to watch, old TV shows and old dramas and stuff. And they keep them for. I mean, every now and then, the, like on on the seven streaming service, they got Heroes for some reason. Every now and then, you see you see one come from the twenty years ago, or whatever. But usually, they just disappear. They're gone. 
and they're not making money out of that. They, they've disappeared. And I feel like I get why you can't have new TV shows and new movies in a Spotify type thing because they cost too much. Like it doesn't cost hundreds of millions of dollars to make a song. It does cost hundreds of millions of dollars to make a movie, right? And they, so I get that. But once they've had their release, once the streaming services are, are finished with them, like let's say a year or two years or whatever, like that after they've been out, just set, it, just set a time. I don't care what it is. They then, they then become open to some service that you that you subscribe for 40 bucks a month or 50 bucks a month or whatever and you get the lot all of it you get all the back catalogs yeah. and then you and then out of that $50 they get a buck or two bucks every time someone watches something like whatever it is that would add up that would be real money that that they gain zero from at the moment for this back catalog and i feel like that's something that consumers of entertainment would love I, I, I'm sure heaps of people would pay for that, and the and it, and but at the same time, it's money. Yeah, it, it's it's money that they're not getting at the moment. So that would just be extra money, and that could replace residuals. Like that could replace that that area. Like where where where, where the actors from Friends are currently getting stuff for for Slovakia watching them on cable. Yep. They would now get from the Spotify for TV shows. Well, they do. Right? I mean, that's the thing. I mean, when Seinfeld got bought by Netflix, or mm-hmm. I, I forget what Friends is on, but mm-hmm. but it's really good. All it's even, for the traditional old people, it's really great because you have all these different platforms mm-hmm. bidding to get that on their platform, mm-hmm. having to pay a premium, and it brings in another. I forget how much Seinfeld went to, but you know, those guys made a lot of money sure. from Seinfeld and all of a sudden, wow, here's another $500 million, you know? I, I w- I w- sorry, I was going to I was going to say, I wouldn't even care if you excluded some. If you said, okay, Seinfeld isn't going to be on the, the Spotify for TV because yeah. it makes so much money for streaming services right now. That's fine. Yeah. But just, just I'm just thinking about this huge, like moonlighting. Well, but, but Spotify- Where do you go for moonlighting? Yeah, yeah. Like, like it just uh, yeah, go on. Well, but but actually, the streaming services are Spotify. But the thing is, it there's ten of them, and they're all competing. And they and they they destroy their catalog. Exactly. Like, and now, that's that's what's so annoying. Now I gotta say, yeah. one thing you have to remember. I bet if we talk to those people, they'd say, "Yeah, yeah you guys say that the Mary Tyler Moore, yeah, Canon, yeah. um, you know, Alias Smith and Jones, the Partridge yeah. Family. People say they want that, and it comes on, and we get about five days of viewership." And then it just goes away. And yeah. People don't watch it. They say they want it and they don't. Um, but now on the other hand, one of the problems with Spotify, for example, mm-hmm. is that the, the rights holders, they all have agents and people who are in getting the most money they can get from them, mm-hmm. right? But then sometimes you have the studios that actually control the strings. So I know a little bit about Spotify. So the labels were actually getting three income streams from Spotify, Okay, so first of all, Spotify said to labels, hey, we'll basically give you three or four or five points to Spotify just to make you mm. put us on the same thing. So we make money, you make money. They said, sure. Yeah. And then they said, hey, so for this music, um, we'll give you a dollar a song or whatever. And the label says, fine, we'll take 50 cents of that and we'll give the other 50 cents to the artist, right? Mm-hmm. So that's the second income stream for the label. And then originally when Spotify came to the label and said, hey, we want to talk to you about doing the streaming service. Just give us all your music. We'll all make money together. They said... That's great. Give us $20 million to sit down and talk to you about it. Yeah. And we won't share that with Bruce Springsteen or Bailey Joel or anything like that. We'll <laughs> yeah. just put it. Okay. So that's one of the things that yeah. made Spotify so difficult mm. because the label is extorting them for money just yeah. to come to the table, taking half the money they do make, and then getting another yeah. percentage of it. So the back end. Yeah. And so that's kind of what goes on behind the scenes in the TV industry, too, because you have the agents involved, you have the production company that owns the rights. Mm all these other people and they all have to come to the party. And some of them have agents that say, give us your highest offer, give us your highest offer. And some of them say, no, look at the important thing is we just get everything in the same place. And then people like Chaz and Bill will pay for the rest of their lives and we'll all make money. We'll all be happy. Mm. And they'll go, we don't care. Mm. Sit down and give us your best offer. And they say, look, but if we give friends and Seinfeld all the money, we're not going to have enough money for Blossom and Northern Mm. Exposure and all the things Mm. Chaz want to see. And they're going to say, gee, we really don't care. I really, I represent Jerry Seinfeld and Larry David and they're going to want something in the mid nine figures. And, um, and so the economics are very happy, mm-hmm. are very complicated. But I always say, it's re- this isn't the best, it's very complicated. This is the best knowledge I can come from. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's say you have a family and your kids, you got kids, right? Everyone likes cereal, but they all like four different kinds of cereal. The way it works now, is there's all these different shopping centers and they all have a Coles and a Woolies in them and they all have all the cereal and you just drive to whichever one you want. Okay, the way the world works us is that there's only one shopping center and it's through the internet and we all got to (laughs) pay, you know, we all got to pay this, you know, our 
you know, Fox or however much we're paying, 100 bucks a month just for mm-hmm. the internet service, right? So we got to pay to go to the supermarket, which isn't yeah. the way in the real in the real world. They'll say, "Hey, we have free parking because mm-hmm. if we charge, no one will come." Yeah. So then you get to the actual share, sh- shopping company, which you paid money to get to, and there's four separate stores, all of which has a different kind of cereal, yeah. and you have to pay to go to each of the four stores. Yeah. Whereas in the real world, we wouldn't do that. We'd say, "No, we don't want to go to four stores. We just want one store yeah. that has all the cereals, and we don't want to pay for it." But on the internet, because of that, um, because of the monopoly of Foxtel. Of, or whatever the cable services is, the internet service, and then all these different streaming services, it's just, but but uh, but it just comes down to this is the way the economic system works. Everyone has a thing and they package and they package. And right now um, we're seeing all this and all these studios, you know, they have shareholders and they say, look at Paramount, we want you to come up with a streaming thing. Wall Street loves streaming right now, so let's mm-hmm. do it. So Paramount does it and Wall Street says, oh, that's great. Let's knock up Paramount's stock price because they're getting to the streaming business. Mm-hmm. And that goes on for two and a half years and all of a sudden Wall Street says, no, actually. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden Disney and Paramount stock goes in the toilet. And that was before the meltdown we had last year. Mm-hmm. And I didn't even say this, like, um, you know, I'm going to get this wrong, but Disney I think is like at half stock price what it was 18 months mm-hmm. ago netflix netflix is a little bit harder but it went way down it's probably at 60 percent of what it was so all of them are getting hurt, hit right now and like i said warner discovery is in the pits so they're in financially vulnerable and disney is having all these flops so all these companies in their own way are crying mm-hmm. we don't have money and so that's another reason it's going to make it difficult so there's all these economic forces that are mitigating against what you and i both want and that is why some people who aren't me not me. Use other means to get their TV. <laughs> and then movies. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Not me. Uh, but <coughs> thank, <Torrent>. you, <laughs> thank you so much. This has been very enjoyable. This thank you. It's so good fun. to see you. Absolutely. And uh, I didn't get to uh, to my little Hunter Biden thing. You might, People probably probably at home probably think I'm addicted to Hunter Biden. Um, it's just that it's so obviously going to be an impeachment inquiry about this. So I just want to get on top of it before it begins. Um, I've got a lot of interesting things to say about the latest on that. Uh, I'm going to be talking about it on the show, on the Planet America on Friday. So, And I might bring it to Dave because I think he'll want it. Spoiler, we, you know, we, we talked a little bit about Devin Archer. Well, I had a look at the transcript and it's uh, not what it was billed to be, shall we say. So um, I wouldn't necessarily be trusting much of what James Comer has to say from now on. Let's just put it that way. Um, I'll be talking about that on the uh on the show uh, on Friday and uh, n- nothing on this Friday for the podcast. Uh, Dave will be back next Friday. So uh, I'll see you guys then and I'll see you soon. Bill. Hey, Thank good you so to much. see you and good Thanks. to see all of you too. Thank you. Bye. Keep happy. Bye.